Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the second HPV symposium that this year is focusing on islet transplantation, cutting edge uh, uh, treatment, both for diabetes mellitus and chronic pancreatitis. Now, uh, Downstate's president, uh, Dr. Riley, has a keen interest in the treatment um, of diabetic patients for our community here at Downstate. <clears throat> he is not in town today, and I have asked our dean, Dr. Michael Lucchese, to say a few words on his behalf. Dean Lucchese. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So this is, a, this is a great day, and I want to thank Dr. Grusner for inviting me. This is fantastic. And um, I think you're all going to really enjoy this uh, really power-packed, uh, um, you know, the power-packed speakers that are here. Um, I want to welcome everybody to SUNY Downstate, the only academic medical center in the borough of Brooklyn, a, Brooklyn that has, a borough that has 2.6 million people in it a borough that it has uh, rampant um, diabetes and sequelae of diabetes for numerous reasons, an underserved population. Um, and it's uh, really important to have symposium like this to uh, bring the attention uh, to everyone, not only everyone on campus, but uh, everyone in the borough of Brooklyn and everyone in the city of New York. Um, and so um, I want you all to enjoy this day. It's really fantastic, and um, uh, I'll be popping in uh, during the course of the day, and uh, I hope you, um, you come away with this, realizing the incredible epidemic that we, that we have here um, in, uh, in Brooklyn, um, and, and actually in the country. If you look, um, diabetes deaths, sequelae from diabetes deaths are, are you know, are bet between the Bronx and Brooklyn highest uh, of anywhere in New York City, and those numbers rival uh, the state. And, and uh, in, in the greatest city in, uh, in the world, it's just crazy how we have this. So we have to do something about this. We have to do something about our diabetics. And uh, this, is a, this is a phenomenal opportunity that we have here, again, in the only academic medical center in the borough of Brooklyn. So enjoy the day. So just a few um, uh, brief remarks um, initially for those that are not familiar with islet transplantation. Islet transplantation can be done as auto islet transplants, meaning using the patient's own islets, or allotransplantation, where you take the pancreas from a deceased donor and give it to a patient um, with diabetes. Just a few words about diabetes in general and following up on what the dean just said. 30 million Americans are diabetic, about 2 million are type 1 diabetics. Um, 89 million Americans are pre-diabetic. Um, that means every third of us is or will be pre-diabetic and every third of that third will eventually develop diabetes. I mean that, the magnitude of it is. We have spent in the last few years a half a trillion a year, not billion, a half a trillion, almost $500 billion for the treatment of diabetes, much more than we have spent for the, day, for the uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan together, and that on an annual basis. Chronic pancreatitis is not as common. The incidence is about 10 to 15 per 100,000. Uh, the prevalence is about 50 per 100,000, but it is a disease that is crippling to the patients that end up with it, and we will hear much more about it uh, later today. Islet transplantation has had a major impact also on the field of transplantation itself. It's not a solid organ, and uh, the cellular components and how it interacts with transplant immunology really uh, came to surface for the last 20 years and have also influenced widely the field of solid organ transplantation. Um, you will hear later from some of the speakers that the first xenotransplants <laughs> that we are planning are not xenotransplants in solid organ transplantation, but uh, in cellular transplantation. So it clearly is an entity that will stay around both from the research point of view as well as from the clinical um, avenue. The uh, international, or there was a time when pancreas and islet transplantation were considered uh, combined entities. Um, in the 1970s, the International Pancreas and Islet uh, Transplant Registry was founded. 
Um, later, it was split into the International Pancreas Transplant Registry, which we still run here from downstate, and we have about 60,000 transplants worldwide in that registry. Um, reporting is mandatory from the, uh, in the United States through UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing, but we also have the data from Japan, from Eurotransplant, uh, from South American countries. It's a wealth of information, and uh, uh, I think the same will happen um, and continue with the International um, Islet Transplant Registry. Now, we have assembled some of the leaders uh, in the field, um, in the nation, and usually, I mean, you will meet them at national or international meeting. It is great that they are here in Brooklyn. Um, I think they all have underestimated um, how long it takes from downstate to any of the airports. So some of our invited speakers will have to leave early just to catch their flights in time because, as you all know, we don't have a highway from here to LaGuardia nor to JFK. I think we would need it, but uh, as you all know, it takes sometimes a couple of hours to get back to the airport. Now, I want to uh, pay tribute and homage to the person who started it all and without whom we may not be here today the way we are. And this is my former teacher and mentor and then later partner and friend, David Sutherland. David Sutherland is uh, um, uh, a homegrown Minnesotan. He is still in Minnesota, but he was one of the first ones to, uh, in the second century of the 20th, uh, uh, second part of the 20th century, to uh, become one of the great American surgeons. <clears throat> David was the first one to describe um, what we are talking about um, over the next uh, couple of hours. Uh, the first one to describe total pancreatectomy with eyelid autotransplant, meaning taking the cells from an individual and giving it to that person for the purpose of making the patient pain-free and also insulin-dependent. Now, this happened in 1977. It took about 20 years until it took roots, and many of the things that he described back then from the surgical point of view are still valid today. I'll give you one example. <clears throat> Um, with that procedure, we always try to preserve the spleen. It took another 20, 25 years until uh, Andrew Washoe, the chairman at the MGH, introduced spleen-preserving uh, pancreatectomies uh, for cancer operation. Uh, there are many other things that David Sutherland has done during his distinguished career. In 1978, uh, he did the first eyelid allotransplant from living donors. Um, just think about that going to the IRB these days and proposing to take half of a donor pancreas, living donor pancreas out, and putting those cells with uncertain outcome into a family member. Um, he was also the first one to do living donor pancreas transplants, where he took the tail of the pancreas and transplanted it into one individual. That happened in 1979, and then in the mm -hmm. 1990s, we actually did combined, for the first time, combined solid organ transplants were removed a kidney and a portion of the pancreas for the sake of a recipient. So David has been instrumental in many, many ways to the field, and many of the speakers today, Paul Robertson um, was his longtime um, associate in the field of endocrinology, yeah, but others from the University of Minnesota, like Mike Maurer, who could show that some of the diabetic changes over time are reversible if a successful pancreas or islet transplant can be done, or Bill Kennedy, who taught us about the consequences of untreated autonomous and peripheral neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy, and the cure through transplantation were instrumental in this field. And he really uh, assembled a team of specialists early on in Minneapolis that were dedicated to the treatment of diabetes. Um, in the 1990s, uh, Dr. Bernhard Herring, now one maybe the leading um, islet uh, researcher and uh, clinician in the world, uh, joined us in Minnesota, and he will talk later about some of the things that went on um, over the years in Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Milena Berlin, um, who is running the auto eyelid transplant program in children for hereditary pancreatitis and other causes, will also talk to us. And then uh, Dr. Apakalai, <coughs> who is actually doing the, the uh, eyelid isolation for us, in Kentucky until we have um, our own lab. And I can tell you with the support of the president, the dean, and so forth, 
we are on a good way <clears throat> to have this established, hopefully, by the beginning of next year. It, Dr. Apakalai is probably uh, the best um, isolationist in the country. And um, I'm saying that with a purpose. I mean, there are many surgeons that can perform a total pancreatectomy successfully, um, but there are very few people that actually can do successfully an eyelid isolation. So you will um, hear from him later. But all of them have in common that they worked, um, that we all worked with uh, David Sutherland and were, were um, um, inspired by him. Uh, this shows you a view of... Uh, uh, Minneapolis uh, from many years ago. Um, I left Minneapolis in 2007. Um, you can see it on the right side. Uh, the Mississippi runs right through it. Uh, these are the research buildings. This is the hospital here. And this is how David Sutherland always uh, described himself um, planting beta cells for replacement and cure of diabetes um, in Minneapolis. And we had at some point every seventh pancreas transplant in the world done in Minneapolis. And then here you can see Bernard Herring and uh, David Sutherland uh, um, at, uh, uh, with me at a meeting um, in the probably midnight, probably around 2005. Um, David uh, retired from clinical work in, in 2011. And here is David again with uh, Paul Robertson. Um, and in the middle is Max Dubernard. It's a very small community. Max Dubernard was a urologist who got involved in pancreas transplantation and he developed a technique that's called duct injection. <clears throat> As a urologist, um, he hated the pancreas because of all the terrible uh, pancreatitis complications, so he said we have to get rid of the exocrine pancreas, so he injected polymer into the pancreatic duct to atrophy the organ. Now, he went on, actually, to become, as a urologist, the first surgeon to do a face transplant, a successful face transplant. You have heard about that patient who subsequently, I think 10 years later, died. And he also was the first one to perform a hand transplant. Now next year for the third HBB symposium, we will talk about these new cutting things, um, uterine transplants, face transplants, um, hand transplants, and so forth. And we will invite um, um, Max Duberna to give a talk. He uh, is also a greater than life figure he became a senator in the French Assembly. He was the mayor of Lyon. Um, again, I mean, certain people like David Sutherland, I mean, really excel and um, make things happen that very few individuals can. I will stop here. Um, I have to remind myself that we are a little bit in a time crunch because we have to um, stop in time today. Um, and uh, I also want to thank our sponsors um, who made the symposium possible, as you know, uh, uh, academic department these days are poor departments, and we depend on the support of um, um, industry for unrestricted grants, and I um, would like to thank um, all of our um, sponsors to come to our help in that regard and make this symposium possible. Now, um, the order of the symposium has changed just slightly in that we have Dr. Banerjee give the first talk. Dr. Banerjee is professor of medicine, and she's the chief of the Division of Endocrinology here at Downstate. She um, received her um, MD from Temple University, but then went through the ranks um, here at uh, Downstate, um, being a medical student, a resident, a fellow, a junior faculty, a senior faculty, and now being the chief um, of the Division of Endocrinology. Um, she is a prolific researcher with um, um, over 100 publications, over 100 abstracts on various topics of diabetes. She is a strong supporter of what we are doing here with pancreas and eyelid transplantation. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to her as she is going to talk to us about the economic burden of diabetes mellitus. Dr. Banerjee. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for those remarks. And particularly, thank you for inviting me to give a talk at this wonderful symposium. And I hope I can do you justice on the topic of the economics of diabetes. So first, I'd like to ask, does anybody here have any have diabetes or have relatives with diabetes or know people with diabetes? Can we have a show of hands? Can you raise your hands up? OK, looks to me, uh, for the statisticians, that this must be 99% with a positive p-value. So diabetes is an important thing for absolutely everybody. So I have no disclosures. 
Some of the learning objectives, I'm glad I had that slide up because I can see we have a lot of students. Uh, the, one of them is the cost of diabetes, healthcare resources, the issue of financial burden, lost productivity. We'll get a little, deep, a little dive into the analysis of costs and then ask, is there a way forward out of this? So what is diabetes? It's an excessive blood sugar. There are a variety of ways of defining it. Uh, for example, uh, the fasting glucose of over 126, the random glucose of 200 or greater plus symptoms, an A1C of 6.5, and we can also do an oral glucose tolerance test. Uh, these excess blood sugars are complicated. Uh, uh, the problem with diabetes is not so much the sugar per se, but actually the complications that ensue. And the complications are um, varied. They can involve almost every single organ in the body, more than what's up here, from an excess of stroke, um, cardiovascular disease and heart attacks, peripheral artery disease, those are the macrovascular problems, and then come the, micro, uh, angio the microvascular problems, including peripheral neuropathy, the renal diseases, diabetic foot problems, and then a myriad of eye problems, some of which end up in blindness. So um, this is essentially what the main problem is with diabetes. It's also a global problem. Uh, Dr. Grusner mentioned that we have a lot of people with diabetes in Brooklyn, probably a quarter million people, because it's about 10% of the population of 2.5 million. Um, it's a global problem, and there are um, about 425 million people in the world today with diabetes. The largest number currently uh, happens in uh, the Western Pacific and China. The next uh, greatest is in uh, uh, the Indian subcontinent, and then comes the United States and Europe. But everywhere, diabetes is increasing, and the question is it doesn't seem to be slowing down regardless of our appreciation of um, uh, all the, about the problem and its mechanisms. And so the question really is, what is it that's causing the entire world to unite over this thing and inc double its, pop uh, its population of this particular disease? The prevalence of diabetes then by age and... Um, uh, uh, age on this axis, uh, and you can see that it's rising. The pre-diabetes is tremendous. There's diagnosed diabetes and undiagnosed diabetes, and in here, there's an incredible number of individuals, roughly almost 40% of the patients have uh, diabetes in this middle-aged group. 100 million adults now have diabetes or pre-diabetes. More than 30 million adults have diabetes. And this constitutes nine point, almost 10% of the adult population. It's the seventh leading cause of death. And every 21 seconds, just get this, another person is diagnosed with diabetes. And you can have an innumerable statistics like this. They go on and on. And the question is, what are we going to do about it? Who has diabetes? So the, the largest uh, percentage of individuals are in the um, uh, American Indian and Alaska Natives, 15% of this population has diabetes. These are the Pima Indians and Alaskans. Asians have also a very high rate, between 7 and 9%. This is South Asians who are from uh, uh, the subcontinent of India, as well as uh, East Asians from China. Uh, African Americans have 12 to 13%. Hispanics are 12 to 11%. In some uh, African American populations, the prevalence goes up to 18% among the elderly. Uh, so this is not a trivial issue, and these are the, this is a population that, uh, that, uh, that lives around our hospital. Whites, on the other hand, have about 7 to 8 percent prevalence of diabetes. So it's a major problem in this hospital and in this region. So uh, what does economics mean to a clinician and to a patient? And I had to figure this out once I was assigned the topic. And uh, so I'm going to give you a story about a patient of mine who's a 63-year-old overweight woman who has diabetes for 12 years with many complications. Most importantly, she couldn't see very well. Her blood sugars were too high for the surgeon to perform cataract surgery despite her taking four injections of insulin every day. Her A1Cs were never anywhere near goal. They were about 10 to 11 percent. We had tried, we had sent her to education, to dietitians. We had tried all sorts of medications. She was insured at Kings County, so she didn't have private public insurance where they charge you $2 per prescription. But since she took about eight different medicines, not uncommon for somebody on diabetes, with diabetes, it was $16 a visit, plus her costs of travel. So I sat down and asked, what should we do next? I asked the patient, because I've run out of ideas and also out of time. 
It turns out that she only took one injection of insulin a day because she didn't have any income, and she was too embarrassed to ask her daughter, who did have a job for money, so she could come to her visits and pay for her eight different kinds of medications. So this is a woman who was doing what many patients do, is they take their money that they have and they simply stretch it out to last for the month. They don't take their medicine or they take a much lower dose of medication. And so it's easy for us to prescribe. It's hard for the patient to actually carry out the instructions. Another case is, came from a national public radio, much more fancily presented. And this is about the insulin's high cost leading to lethal rationing. This is a case, a case about a, a man by the name of Alec who needed insulin for his diabetes. And less than a month after he aged out of his mom's insurance, he was dead. His insulin pen was empty and at his side. He was a restaurant manager earning $35,000 a year, but he couldn't afford the insurance. And after considering the cost, he opted out of it. The insurance cost $500 a month, and there was a $7,000 deductible. So after $12,000, the insurance would start to pay in. So he figured he couldn't afford it. And if you take $35,000, you pay a third in taxes and subtract $12,000, you're left with $12,000 to live on. So the question really arose, is access to insulin a human right? The answer, of course, is unknown, and we're in the middle of a lot of turmoil about this. But this is an important issue. So we'll get to the, the macroscopic cost of, uh, of uh, diabetes. For the 24.7 million people who have it, the cost is 327 billion. 237 billion, or 73%, are direct costs, and 90 billion, or 27%, are lost productivity and other issues uh, in that regard. The excess, uh, there's 15 billion for insulin, there is uh, nine, uh, 15 billion for diabetes medicines and 71 billion for other meds for things like hypertension and complications of diabetes and 70, nearly 70 billion for hospitalizations for complications. So let's take a little bit more of a closer look at all this stuff. This will look like a very busy slide, but this is the healthcare resources attributed to or incurred by diabetes as a percent of the national utilization. You can see that um, we've divided things into healthcare resources such as institutional care, that's hospitalizations, nursing homes, inpatients, hospice, and outpatient care, physicians' offices, ER, hospital OPDs. So just instead of focusing on the details of the numbers, just focus on the blue arrows for one. Uh, in uh, terms of millions of units, the United States as a total uses 162 units of uh, hospital care. People with diabetes, use 40 of those units, and that works out to being about a quarter of all the units of hospitalizations are used by a person with diabetes. 13% of that is attributed directly to diabetes. But otherwise, it's a much greater number incurred by people with diabetes. The same thing is true for nursing home and resident facilities. 26% of the total US uh, uh, use of this particular uh, health resource is used by people who have diabetes. So moving down to this portion of it, the outpatient care aspect, half of the costs incurred by people with diabetes are attributed directly to diabetes. So these are the overall costs of people with diabetes, and half of them are directly attributed to their diabetes. This is another slide that looks a little busy, uh, pr produced by the American Diabetes Association in 2017, and has to do with healthcare expenditures attributed directly to diabetes by diabetes status and type of service. What are the types of services? Institutional care, as we mentioned, outpatient care, and outpatient medications and supplies. This is the total cost in the United States in this particular analysis. This is $1.7 trillion, and one quarter of that is used by, incurred by people who have diabetes. So that's about 24%. And that's where we get the notion that one in four dollars, healthcare dollars, are spent by people with diabetes. The next little bit of statistic that's over here is this number of 230, how do I go back? 237,000 dollars, which is, turns out to be one in seven healthcare dollars uh, is spent in the directly attributable costs to diabetes. So that's actually a great deal. Much of this is down in here. 
with the $15 billion for insulin, another for diabetes meds, and $71,000 for all the other meds. And these are in billions of dollars. This is not small change, and sometimes it's too much for us to actually envision what that must mean. Now, the nation's healthcare dollar is about $3.5 trillion, or seven, over $10,000 per person in 2017. So we've, in this analysis, only had $1.7 trillion, or half of that total amount. So what on earth is not accounted for? Things like administering government and private pensions, insurance programs, over-the-counter meds, investment in research, infrastructure, disease management and wellness, office visits for things like the dentist, the optometrist, and non-physician -provi non providers. There are a lot of unaccounted for expenses in that previous analysis. What are the big ones? We've just mentioned them. The big ones are um, 71 billion for prescriptions, drugs not for diabetes directly, 70 billion roughly for hospitalizations, 34 billion for insurance and diabetes medicines and supplies, and 30 billion more for office visits and other visits and other providers. Key drivers of these costs turn out to be, as you must, you can figure out, medications, hospitalizations, the complications that drive the hospitalizations, various demographic issues, some populations use more or less, and then again, the uh, sort of mystical thing called indirect costs. Just looked at in a little bit more colorful way is the same thing, uh, looking at hospitalizations and meds for complications, which use up much of the cost, uh, office visits, supplies, etc., the rest of them. What about by age? Who's using all this stuff? So if you take people over 65 and compare them with under 65, it turns out that the per capita, in, per cost per patient uh, is about 13,000 if you're over the age of 65, and about 6,675 if you're under that. And naturally, most of the cost of the people over 65 is borne by Medicare and government spending. But here's that $237,000 total divided up amongst the various age groups. Now, what about if you look at it by different demographics? The big thing here is, the, as I said, the over 65 group, you, the Medicare population uses about $13,000 a year. The rest of them are in the six and $7,000. There's a little blip in the under 18-year-olds, and that is accounted for probably by the, uh, the existence of type 1 diabetes in this group. If you think of uh, the issues of um, sex, it's roughly, roughly equal, men and women. Um, if you look at race and ethnicity, there's a little blip, uh, a greater utilization by non-Hispanic blacks of about $10,470, perhaps accounted for by their increased use of emergency rooms and their increased use of hospital outpatient departments. Now, what are some of the complications that uh, people with diabetes have? Uh, this lists the, the main ones that all of you know, because I think the majority of you are third-year students. Is that correct? Yes, so this is largely for you. So, uh, and you all know that uh, neurological diseases are an important one, for example, strokes. And for the entire population with neurological diseases, 36% of them have diabetes. If you move on to peripheral vascular disease, of the population of people with peripheral vascular disease, 39% of them have diabetes. So we're very over, diabetes is very over-representative in, in lots of these very important and life-changing diseases. 27% of cardiovascular disease, 29% of renal disease, and I see that Dr. Sagi is here, and he can confirm that, if not more, and perhaps this is an underestimate. And of the general medical population that comes in, only 8% of them are attributed to by diabetes. So diabetes is disproportionately loaded with the complications uh, that uh, the disease creates. Now, per capita expenditure, we uh, have had a little thing about that with the, uh, the older people. But people who have uh, diabetes cost two, uh, spend 2.3 times as much as those people without diabetes. So with diabetes, the expenses are about 16,000. Without diabetes, it's 7,000, giving you a differential of about $9,000 that it costs more if you happen to have diabetes. Quite expensive. What about indirect costs? What are indirect costs anyway? I'm going to skip this slide and go to this one which has a little bit more granularity in it, but it's the same slide. What happens is if people are absent, and this accounts for the proportion of the indirect costs, which is 90 billion of 3.7, that's a low, low contributor. Reduced performance at work. People come to work, but since they don't feel well and they're sick, they don't just work very hard. Uh, so that's called uh, present reduced performance at work. Decreased productivity for those not in the, la the labor force is another small number, 2%. 
Uh, reduced labor force participation due to disability is about 42 percent. And early mortality, there are 277,000 deaths, for example, annually in 2017, accounted for 22 percent of all this, of uh, the costs. So a total of um, $89.9,000. And it's hard for us to imagine that when we see patients in terms of thinking in terms of billions of dollars for the population as a whole. But unless we have some sense about this, we're never going to be able to get a handle of it and actually do something about it. Now, the mortality costs, um, for example, uh, the percentage of deaths in the attributable to var various diseases from somebody in diabetes, 54% of the cases don't have renal disease, uh, a third, 25%, 28% of the people have cerebrovascular disease, and 16% have cardiovascular disease. So um, important things. What about trends in diabetes costs? Between 2012 and 2017, uh, there was an increase of uh, quite a few, from $261 billion to $327 billion, re reflecting a 25% increase in over five years, about 5% per year. Now, if you have to adjust for, uh, for example, for inflation, because you do, uh, you, what happens is you find that um, the uh, total direct costs went up 23% and the indirect costs went up tw uh, 26 and 23%. But you can see there's a steady increase from 2007 to 2012 to 2017. If you then say, well, I want to know what um, the prevalence of diabetes also went up, so I'd like to be able to adjust for that as well. And when you adjust for that as well, the costs are going up, but they're going up at a slower rate. 14% for direct costs, which are in red, and 11% growth for indirect costs, which are in blue, giving you an average overall increase, which is inflation and prevalence adjusted, of about 13% rise. So the, price, the costs are actually going up. I'm going to skip this one. And just to mention that diabetes is um, very much of a social burden. Components that were omitted from the previous analysis include intangibles from pain and suffering, resources from care provided by non-paid caregivers, and the burden associated with undiagnosed diabetes. So I'll just give you one example of a case that, uh, that recently was here of a, of a well-established physician who came in with an acute, with a, almost near MI and required a cabbage. And uh, uh, on questioning him, when he first presented, his A1C is 10, so they called us. And he's a physician, works in a hospital, has plenty of access to all sorts of care. He said, yes, about a year ago, my A1C was about 7.2. So what'd you do about it? He says, nothing. I figured it would go away. And it wasn't me. So a year later, he has an MI. He's not very old. He's about 40 years old. And he hadn't done anything about it. So the burden is, so had he done something about it, he wouldn't, may not have required a cabbage. He may have been treated properly. And this is another burden associated with undiagnosed diabetes. Let me take a little dive into the medications. We mentioned all the costs of medications here, which create a, a, a burden for, this, for, the, uh, me, for medical care. What do the medicines actually cost? So in order to present this talk, I actually had to go to a website called GoodRx. Has anybody heard of that one? Yes, some of you have and some of you haven't, so you should all know about it because you have no idea otherwise how to get comparison pricing here. Okay, they give you some discounted prices because they get like manufacturer's discounts. They give you coupons, it's like green stamps when people were younger or maybe when I was young and people put it in a book and got a toaster for it, but it's a similar way of, pro of selling the medications. The cheapest ones are up here. Metformin is $7 a month, but extended release metformin is 320 A liquid one is 200 Glucotrol is a sulfonylurea for 7 So between these two, you can do pretty well. But there are other drugs. These are the newer ones, DPP-4 inhibitors, citagliptin, linagliptin, for $500. The SGLT2 inhibitors, these are the most recent saviors for everyone. These are interesting in that they turn the tap on and they let all the excess glucose out of you, so you have wonderful blood sugars. And in fact, these are supposed to prevent kidney trouble from developing. There's very good evidence-based medicine about this. It prevent, decreases mortality, decreases morbidity. And they're very good things, but what are they? They're about four or $500 a month uh, if you don't have insurance or if you have the kind of insurance that Alec had. How about the GLP-1 receptor agonists? These are the injectables. They work through the incretin system. Victoza, which is a common one, costs $920 a month. Uh, or the extended release version of it is 760. 
and others are in the $700. This was just released last month, not inexpensive. Combination drugs range all the way from $500 to $2,000 a month. Uh, here are all the insulins. The insulins are very old, and uh, the average insulin price is about $500 a month for the ones we generally want to prescribe, which are the analog in, uh, insulins. These are the basal insulins, also very expensive. And finally, there's a very nice insulin which has a long half-life. Patients like it. It's $600 a month. So getting medicines is a very difficult thing. It's very time consuming. You've got to be on the phone with the insurance company to get what you call prior authorization, which is the bane of everyone's existence. So I'm going to recommend that you students, some of you go into the political business, some of you go into the economics business to change the way medicine is practiced. So who uses insulin? Uh, 7.4 million Americans use insulin, 20% of African Americans with diabetes, 14% of whites, and 17% Hispanics. And buried in this little economic analysis uh, is a difference of 6% more African Americans than whites use insulin. And that's because they have two different types of diabetes. Insulin sensitive diabetes, where they don't make any insulin and they're a type 2, and insulin resistant diabetes, in which case they do make insulin, but they're very insulin resistant, and they're like all the other diabetes patients. But this insulin sensitive, unique fraction of patients requires insulin as adults. And finally, a quarter of diabetes patients who are below the poverty level actually require insulin. I'm going to skip this thing about skipping medicines because we heard about it and ask the question, Bant, just to remind you a little historical vignette, you know, Banting and Best discovered insulin in 1921, and in 1923 they got the Nobel Prize for it. But in between, Banting sold the patent for insulin for a dollar to the University of Toronto for the benefit of people with diabetes. And they partnered with Eli Lilly to create a social good so that people who had diabetes would live better and be able to live longer. In 2001, insulin cost $21 a vial, and now it costs four to $600 a month for pen insulin and for vial insulin. So what happened is the American Diabetes Association finally got its act together and decided to go to Congress to testify for the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee of the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce. Why is it costing so much? And why are patients being priced out of a life-saving drug? And what is the human impact of rising insulin prices? So a bunch of the bigwigs from the ADA went down to just to sort of present the human side, the human stories of what happens when you can't afford five or $600 a month uh, for your medications. So a couple of things about complications, and that is, which we might not think of, lower A1Cs are associated with lower costs of, lower health care costs. And I'm just going to leave you with that, because I know I don't have oodles of time to go into this slide. But if the better A1Cs are associated with better uh, economic costs for type 1 diabetes. And this is another data, classic bit of data from uh, the type 1 diabetes um, studies showing you that the lower your A1C, not only is it good for costs, but it's good for decreased progression of complications. And you would expect that. But on the other hand, there's a corollary. The lower A1C is also associated with a much higher rate of severe hypoglycemia. And you can imagine that severe hypoglycemia is not a good thing to have. Besides the patient being sick, requiring a lot of immediate, immediate care, uh, it's, if you have severe hypoglycemia, it's much more costly than if you have non-severe hypoglycemia. Type 2s seem to be a little bit more than type 1s, at least in the British system. So um, I'd like to sort of conclude uh, with a few uh, com summary comments. People with type 2 diabetes have a twofold higher cost of care and costs of diabetes, the cost of uh, their medical care. The expenses associated with diabetes versus no diabetes is a differential of $9,000 for a total of um, $16,000. And the overall cost is $327 billion, utilizing one in four healthcare dollars. Are there any solutions? There are many solutions, and I think this is, some of these are the only way to go. Prevent diabetes. You can do, decrease the multiple risk factors for complications. There's lots of evidence-based medicine for this, and they can all be comp, uh, improved if you optimize glucoses, but it has to be sustained and maintained, which is the tough part. There are these new drugs that I mentioned that are quite expensive, but they may be very beneficial in terms of decreasing chronic kidney disease, 
cardiovascular disease and mortality. And the recent data suggests that perhaps they are not, this mechanism is not via glucose lowering, but via some other direct effect. Other solutions incre include increasing pancreatic beta cell function. How do you do that? One of them is to induce remissions by diet and weight loss, and in the primary care setting it is possible if you lose 15% of your body weight and you started out overweight, but that is almost an impossibly difficult thing to pull off and sustain, but they did it. You can use pharmacotherapy, and, uh, such as uh, lowering the blood sugar and uh, decreasing uh, glucose toxicity, and the beta cells might spring to life for a while, and we have done that quite successfully at Downstate, and you can have remissions lasting up to 15 years. Bariatric surgery is also well known to be doing thing, good things. And then finally, there's beta cell replacement and islet cell transplantation, which is the mission of this particular uh, morning session. And I'm going to leave you with a couple more slides. And the question is, how do people change? Because all the things that I just listed as options of things to do require important uh, behavioral changes for them to succeed. And all important human problems require behavioral change. So if you want to prevent wars, you want to have peace, you want to have income inequality removed or have and the whole issues with xenophobia that's going on all over the world, all of these require behavioral changes for us to succeed. Healthcare requires behavioral changes, uh, particularly. And change is difficult, and most people make irrational decisions about all kinds of things, about their income, their savings, what they want to do with their lives, and people need to be nudged along the road to success. And uh, I was never going to end this talk with this, but my, my reading about economics of diabetes led me to this guy who won the Nobel Prize. And one of the, and I'll show you that in a minute, but he discusses the human element of economics, because ec economics is very sterile. It was all those charts that kind of make you go to sleep immediately. And then they come up with some numbers and they say twofold, and somehow we're supposed to do something with that. But in fact, each individual is a planner and a doer. You know, we have multiple personalities. It's a very Indian concept, right? They have goddesses with 10 heads. What does that mean? It means they have many personalities inside. Okay, each planner signs up. So here's the example. A planner signs up for the yearly gym membership. It expects you to go to the gym every day and get fit. Easy, you know? Planet, uh, planet fitness, $10 a week, or $10 a month. But the doer inside of you doesn't really follow through. It says, repeatedly postpones the gym trip to when it's more convenient, until the year is up. I'll do it next year again. Then the, the, there's the nudge theory, which is created by this economist. and says, nudging is where small stimuli are provided to influence people's behavior. Nudges work at an individual level, but they're also used by larger organizations, such as healthcare and, and companies, to move people along to do the right thing. Because, you know, we can't legislate people's behavior. We have, they have to want to do something. And this guy uh, is called, uh, his name was Richard Thaler. He got the Nobel Prize in 2017 for the evolution of behavioral economics. And his talk was about from cashews to nudges. And what he pointed out is that if you want to nudge people along to do the right thing, you have to do it forever. It doesn't happen just to tell them once to do the right thing. They can't do it. You've got to do it forever. And the reason he got the Nobel Prize was not for healthcare, and we know healthcare works in this way to move people along, because if I have a research coordinator who calls the patient twice a week and says, hey, did you take your medicine and did you exercise, it'll happen. It doesn't happen in real life. People stop their medicines. They don't come back to the, their visits. So nudges are forever, and difficult things require you to be reminded of them and so that you can actually do it. So I think my time is up, isn't it? Yes? Okay. So thank you all for listening, and this is my story on economics. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, for a truly enlightening uh, lecture. Um, you know, it's heartbreaking when you hear about patients who die because they cannot afford buying insulin. It will be upon you, the residents and the medical students, to make this a better world for the next generation. It cannot be that people die in the richest country on the planet because they cannot afford buying insulin. It will be your duty to deliver on that because we, unfortunately, have failed. You have to be better than we are in that regard, and you have to do that over, I mean, your lifetime of uh, professional work. Um, one other uh, brief comment that I wanted to make when I was listening to Dr. Banerjee, um, we are a relatively small transplant center, um, at least currently, 
Um, there are many uh, larger transplant centers who, what I call, are liver-centric, primarily focusing on liver transplantation. What we want to become is really the premier center for transplantation of diabetic patients, for all the very reasons that Dr. Banerjee just had presented to us. And I think we will achieve that with uh, Dr. Salifu and his team of transplant nephrologists, Dr. Banerjee and many others that are devoted to the treatment of diabetes here in Brooklyn at Downstate. Now let me shift gears because we will now go to the chronic pancreatitis. We will come back to diabetes in the afternoon sessions. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Schwartzman to you now as a speaker. Dr. Schwartzman is a professor in chief of uh, general surgery here at Downstate, as you or many of you know. He serves also as the assistant dean for education. He was just elected as the upcoming president for the uh, faculty of all of Downstate. Um, his involvement in administrative duties has risen, and he has um, really been the enabler for this, for this symposium today. There are many more things that I could uh, um, mention about him, but again, I mean, we're a little bit in a time crunch, and I will stop here as Dr. Schwartzman is going to talk to us now about the economic burden of chronic pancreatitis. Dr. Schwartzman. Good morning. A uh, pleasure to welcome everyone here on campus. Um, so very quickly, um, our goal today is it's quite simple, is to eliminate at least the burden of, of diabetes that is caused by chronic pancreatitis, and thus eliminate that cost from all the equations that Dr. Banerjee had just told us. So I think that's not a big deal, and I think with all the expertise in this room, this is the direction that we are going to this is what I'm going to talk about, and it's very quickly, it's a long agenda, but Dr. Grusin told me to cut half of my slides yesterday, last night, and I did, but I still intend to go through all of these slides as I go forward. We'll talk about epidemiology, etiology, classification, likelihood of, of chronic pancreatitis, a little bit of Hafiz, just because I like Hafiz as a writer, economic burden, symptoms, long-term sequela, Louis Prima, because he is just uh, quirky and fun, and I'll explain why I wanted to present him. We'll talk about causes of death of, uh, acute, of chronic pancreatitis, lazy statistics, and children, and then a little bit of television. One of the things about chronic pancreatitis, it's such a difficult disease to define. Uh, it's a disease that has originally been described, or at least relationship to alcohol has been described in, uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century. But then there are so many multiple classifications based on everything that was done since then. The classifications have changed. There is lots of them, and they all talk about various and different things about chronic pancreatitis, not really concentrated on anything in particular. The epidemi epidemiology, therefore, is quite difficult because obviously when you cannot compare things as equals, it becomes very, very difficult. And also, the decrease in the rate of post-mortem examinations makes the examination of the pancreas um, uh, significantly more difficult. And this is just an illustration of a, a, probably about half of a quarter of all the classifications that we have for chronic pancreatitis. Uh, and I will quote uh, Dr. Grusner, who says, when you have so many classifications or so many ways of doing certain things, probably none of them really work quite well. And indeed, none of them really work quite well. And one of the important ones is the tiger classification. And that takes advantage of various etiological risk factors and actually classifies them. So at least from that perspective, it is quite important. Uh, and any time we have such a difficult topic to discuss, uh, I think it's always important to bring ourselves back to why we are all here. And we are all here really to improve ourselves as physicians, as students, in order to take care of the patients. And I want to bring us very briefly to a bedside of a patient that we had a privilege of taking care of here at Downstate, and some of the residents will remember her, as well as our physician assistant. So the patient, and it's a part one, because she'll weave her story, we'll go through the presentation somewhat. She's a 39-year-old female with history of chronic pancreatitis for the past 11 years. She was diagnosed with something called sphincter of Ori type 3 dysmotility. Have anyone here from all the esteemed colleagues have seen such a disorder, or 
had it confirmed? I don't think so. And actually, the entity is now very much is disputed by Wilcox from University of Alabama, who believes that this is just a functional uh, abdominal pain and nothing specific. But she was given a diagnosis, and perhaps uh, that gave her some reprieve for a little bit. Multiple ERCPs, multiple pancreatic stents. And finally, as many of our, procedure, of our patients end up having, they end up having cholecystectomy as a first step. Of course, it didn't do anything. Then, as some of our patients, she also had a Whipple, which is a pancreatic radionectomy for our medical students, which is a removal of a good portion of the pancreas. And did that do anything? Absolutely not. She still continued to have pain. She had celiac block blocks several times. Nothing worked. She wasn't able to eat, and she had a jejunostomy to place. She wasn't tolerating it, and she was on TPN for two years prior to coming to our center. Now, this is only a fraction of her history, but it really shows, and, and for those of us who have a great fortune of being able to help this patient, this story is quite typical. All these patients come with this kind of presentation. So it's extremely extremely difficult to make sense of all this. But let's go back to the epidemiology. And epidemiology deals mainly with alcoholic-related pancreatitis, and the age is usually worldwide was documented to be around 40s, late 40s, 50s. Um, there, is a, uh, there is some recognition that came from the Brazilian study, however, that alcohol pancreatitis was seen only, thank you, was seen only in 40% of patients and then they really concentrated on some of the other things, identifying idiopathic pancreatitis, familial, and tropical pancreatitis, which now is probably believed to be um, uh, somewhat of an idiopathic pancreatitis going away from the tropical terminology. There is a marked gender difference, of course. Predominantly, it's a disease of men. Uh, uh, in some series, it's as high as 90 to 95%. Uh, however, in the United, because most of them are related to alcohol, in the United States we are much more gender equal, and in the United States indeed the incidence of alcoholic-related pancreatitis is probably equally split between men and women. Uh, the recent Haas study in Holland shows approximately the same results. What's interesting about this table, and this is the incidence and prevalence, but this table is actually just the incidence. But if you look at some of the trends, if you look at England and Wales, in the 1969 study, the incidence was about 1%. And in later studies, it had risen to 8.6. And if you look to some of the other countries that actually do talk about the incidence and increase or decrease, none of the countries have a decrease in incidence of pancreatitis. It is on the rise throughout the world. Uh, what's interesting about this particular study is, again, the recognition that initially in Italy, in Italian studies from 1995, the incidence related to alcohol was 74%, but in later studies it was only 34%. So it's probably not truly changing incidence, however, it's change of recognition of what is the real issue. In the United States, the decrease in alcoholic-related pancreatitis is not as marked, but it is also present. Uh, this is an interesting study, uh, widely uh, quoted in literature. It's the Olmsted study. And <clears throat> again, it illustrates the fact this is the line of the incidence and this is the line of the pre uh, prevalence. And it deals with the fact that in men, it is non-alcoholic pancreatitis in incidence and in prevalence that is really the highest. So it, there is a shift from believing that it's the alcohol that is the primary cause of pancreatitis to other causes, and we'll get into it in a little bit. Well, we can't get away from alcohol and pancreatitis. It's a well-established entity. Uh, what I want to point out to the fact that um, men consuming 100 grams of alcohol per day were at 11-fold higher risk than control non-drinkers to develop chronic pancreatitis. This is quite relevant. Now, does anybody know how many grams are in one shot of hard liquor? Five? Okay, I feel like an auctioneer. Come on, give me something else. Four. It's 12. So to have 100 grams of alcohol a day, it's a significant number of alcohol. This is an additional study from France documenting that the incidence of pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, that is, is 83% related to alcohol. 
And it also is interesting that 67% of patients have 40 uh, grams of alcohol. And it, so this is actually not exactly the case because it looks like having over 120 grams of alcohol has a protective effect. It's, it's really not the case. It's just that the patients who do have it, 32% um, uh, uh, only, uh, probably many of them had died along the way and uh, had less alcohol. Uh, <clears throat> the prevalence. Not everybody who drinks and develops and, and drinks alcohol will develop pancreatitis. And the incidence probably uh, is roughly 1% uh, to 3% to So it's really not quite significant, but of course it's, pr it's present. Smoking is a very significant risk factor. Uh, it, uh, it worsens the pancreatitis in those patients who do develop it. And smoking cessation does cause remission or does lessen the progression of the disease. Um, idiopathic pancreatitis is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, according to recent data, uh, only about 6 to 8% of cases in Europe um, had uh, been diagnosed as idiopathic pancreatitis. And the natural history of idiopathic pancreatitis can be divided into two. The early onset and the late onset, those who are in the early onset develop it in the second and third uh, decade of life, and this is usually takes a while to develop, and patients live for a longer period of time. And exocrine, and in late stages, it's primarily the exocrine and endocrine deficiency that can occur even without pain. Uh, the tropical pancreatitis is probably, uh, based on the literature at this point, should be considered not a misnomer, but it's really not an entity. And it's more now likely to be classified as an idiopathic. It was attributed in the past to be caused in all kinds of things. It was attributed to be caused by, uh, uh, by intrauterine malnutrition, high cassava intake, dietary toxic, etc. But it's now reclassified as idiopathic growing pancreatitis, and it's important to keep in mind that it's seen as probably one of the more common causes of pancreatitis in many parts of the world, including North India, in South India, in the state of Kerala. We have 70% incidence uh, of chronic pancreatitis that is due to idiopathic pancreatitis. And as you can see, the prevalence is quite high. Uh, autoimmune, biliary disease, and genetic diseases Genetic diseases are becoming more and more important when we talk about children with chronic pancreatitis. Uh, biliary disease is a rather uncommon cause of chronic pancreatitis, although we, see, we do see it as a cause of acute pancreatitis. And autoimmune pancreatitis is also fairly uncommon. Well, this particular uh, uh, classification is important because it attempts to classify all the things that we have discussed into some kind of a reasonable sort of schema that we can all understand. I also like to point it out because of the brilliance of people who devised it, because their name is actually the name of the classification system. So this is from uh, University of Heidelberg, and uh, the, it's located in the city of Meinheim in Germany, and this, the, the classification is called Meinheim classification. How did they do it? Well, it's very ingenious. They decided that M is for pancreatitis, huh? but it's with multiple risk factors, so therefore it's an M. Okay. Then, of course, nicotine is important, uh, and um, they, I'm sorry, I skipped alcohol. Uh, excessive consumption, increased consumption, moderate consumption. So it attempts to classify how patients behave, nutritional factors, uh, hereditary factors, which are very important, efferent duct factors, which really relate to all issues of pancreatic and biliary anatomy, immunological factors that are less significant, less important, and of course, other miscellaneous causes. Uh, this gives a scoring system. So this is a little complex, a little complicated in a way that, you know, to implement something like this in your system <clears throat> could be difficult, but yet it organizes things in an appropriate fashion to give us some kind of idea. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to give you, for example, an idea, uh, endocrine insufficiency will give you, if you have it, it's zero. If you don't have it, it's four. So it assigns a score to all the particular things that deal with the presentation of the disease 
uh, with alcohol consumption, exocrine insufficiency, etc. And, <clears throat> and thus it provides us with some kind of classification. The classification, as you can see, is from minor to exacerbated, and it deals with the number of points, and it's quite easy to actually for somebody to get to 11 or 15 points, and that classifies as an advanced pancreatitis. Uh, we don't have much data yet in terms of how this classification impacts how we deal with the patients, but perhaps as we go forward, at least something that I would look here is would like to do here is to implement this classification, and although it's a little bit difficult. How likely pancreatitis is to develop? Well, it develops uh, in about 10% of patients with the first attack, and it can progress to 36% incidence in patients who have had repeated acute attacks of pancreatitis. And it's important also to remember that once someone develops chronic pancreatitis second time, the incidence increases rapidly to 38%. Our patient, we'll come back to her, I told you. So she was admitted to UHB, and she did have total pancreatectomy and eyelid autotransplantation. Uh, if you'll remember, she had a Whipple procedure, so a good portion of her pancreas was gone. And yet, thanks to um, Dr. Bala, she had 400,000 uh, international equivalents of eyelids harvested. Uh, she uh, had it uh, reinfused. Uh, stayed in the ICU for four days, as is customary for these patients, at least for the time being here for us. And she was discharged after, initial after additional five days, total of nine days in the hospital. <clears throat> the costs, oh my God, this is so difficult to discuss, and Dr. Benerji talked about it a little bit as well, direct and indirect. Direct is something that really relates to doctor's visit, operations, everything that you can put a real price on. The indirect stuff is practically impossible, especially in children. How many days will the patient's uh, mother or father lose when they go with their child to the hospital or when the child is hospitalized? How many days will they uh, lose for all this? It's truly impossible. What about the length of stay for a person who works and they can't go to the work? So <clears throat> there is some data indicating that the, due to the financial, the, the patients do have significant financial difficulties. In the UK, there is a series of, that indicates 37% of patients with chronic pancreatitis were unemployed, 37%. There's another French study that shows that 12% were unable to work because of illness, and ability to work significantly declines as the disease progresses. There is a very granular study from Germany uh, that indicated that only 41% of the patients worked full-time, 3% part-time, 23 had retired due to the age, uh, or at least used that as a reason. 14% had disease-related early retirement, 30% were prolonged unemployment, and 6% were undefined. And yet, of the employed pa patients, of the employed patients that were 41% or so, 40% of those had disease-related absence in the previous year. Uh, indirect and derivative economic considerations. It's, uh, there were a nice study published in UK, uh, about 265 patients. 14% of patients took early retirement. 13 had a period of prolonged unemployment. And you get it. There is just very, very difficult. But it's also very difficult to try to really put a price on this. Now, there is some data from the United States, and I do want to point it out, that <clears throat> from the U.S., the cost secondary to lost productivity from work-related absences related to pro productivity, unemployment, and premature mortality from all causes diabetes, that's from everything, and this is what Dr. Benerger was talking about before, is $58 billion per year, an astronomical amount. If we assume, and that's why I call this derivative, if we assume that uh, pancreatic disease accounts for 0.5 to 1% of all patients of the, with all cases of diabetes, then the indirect cost could be as high as <coughs> 290 to $580 million a year due to chronic pancreatitis. Uh, this is a slide, and the numbers are here are from 2010. So the overall cost direct due to treatment of chronic pancreatitis in the U.S. in 2010 was $2.5 billion. 
and you will see in the next slide that the reason I like this slide is actually shows the breakdown. 327,000 uh, admissions to the hospital, 200,000 attendants at the emergency departments, and 532,000 visits from the doctors. So that accounted in 2010 for $205 billion, and this is a table that shows how exponentially the number had increased just in the span of four years. So total cost 2.5, in 2014, it's estimated to be $3.57 billion. Now we can all sort of try to project what it could be in 2019. Now, take a little pause, we take a little break, just because we should. Take a, brief, take a little breath, and um, a little something always should be done to, to just enjoy what we do in life. And it should always be either hearing music uh, or reading music if we can't hear it. Uh, I like Hafiz, so I, that's why I use this opportunity to show it to you. I'll read the slide. And still after all this time, the sun, will never say, will, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. We continue. Now back to pancreatic insufficiency. Okay, <laughs> breathe again. So 57% um, will develop pancreatic, will have to take um, enzyme supplements. And of course, the cost just probably from the pancreatic insufficiency due to the medications taken is $75 million a year. Quite significant. Now, the most important thing I want to indicate about chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic exocrine insufficiency is the fact that the insurance companies are very, very difficult to deal with with prescribing of any supplements, Creon, for example, or whatever it could be, whatever your preference is. You have to have, according to the insurance companies, a strict, strict criteria. If elastase is not what it should be, according to their guidelines, patient is not going to get Creon. Actually, the newer classifications do indicate that if the patient either has a documented elastase or whatever the measurement you take, deficiency, or they improve with administration of enzymes, that is considered an exocrine insufficiency. And this is something important. It becomes part of our advocacy, part of what we need to do as a group of future physicians, current physicians, is advocate for our patients. And this is something that is really unacceptable. We can't get, I have two patients now that we can't get insurance companies to give them medication just because their elastase levels are not what they should be. So it, this is changing. Uh, we will continue to skip time a little bit. Uh, this is uh, endocrine insufficiency, going back to Dr. Benerge's presentation. Uh, and I'll just concentrate on this. In patients with pancreatic uh, diseases, the median survival is 25 years after diagnosis. That's with chronic pancreatitis. And the mortality is uh, frequently secondary uh, to nephropathy. So this is in patients, not just patients who have uh, diabetes for whatever reason, but this is specifically for patients with chronic pancreatitis. The most significant complaint, of course, is abdominal pain. This is what brings the patient to the doctors. This is why they get admitted most of the time. And the other things occur later. The exocrine and endocrine insufficiency will happen, but they will not happen right away. Uh, this is some of the quality of life concern. We are using a downstate, the SF36 uh, form. I think most programs use a variation of it. Although there is a specific Pancoli scores, and this is specifically for patients with pancreatitis, it's developed as a tool. I don't think it's widely used as of now. Risk of cancer in, um, in chronic pancreatitis. It's quite significant. There are a land, several studies, and the incidence is anywhere between 1.2% to about 28 and even higher to about 4% in approximately seven years. So we know for sure that there is a correlation between the duration of chronic pancreatitis and development of pancreatic cancer. Um, it's also important to remember that in the specific subset of patients uh, with hereditary pancreatitis is 69-fold the general population, and in tropical pancreatitis, which is now idiopathic pancreatitis, it could be even higher. This is other causes uh, of diseases in patients with chronic pancreatitis. Very quickly to go through that, liver cancer, small intestinal cancer, lung cancer, 
cerebrovascular disease, pulmonary disease, ulcer disease, and all these are significantly higher than in general population. The survival and mortality. Well, overall mortality rate at the, from the time of diagnosis at 10 years was approximately 30% in several of the studies, uh, and the mortality can be as high as 55% at 20 years. And all studies are documenting the same thing, with exception of studies that um, indicate that patients with idiopathic pancreatitis have significantly longer duration of life. The most common malignancy is the pancreatic cancer. And this is just for us to be again, we take a, quite, a tiny, tiny break again, uh, just to show that we can be a little bit uh, humorous and a little bit uh, just, uh, we don't have to be always very serious and take ourselves very seriously. This is from Louis Prima. Louis Prima, for those of you who may have heard him, he was a famous musician. Uh, in the 1950s, 1960s. He was a trumpet player, and this is from one of his songs. I just found this as very interesting, not the frequently uh, probably sourced uh, person at medical conferences. But just so we take ourselves a little bit less seriously, I'll tell you, hon, I read a little bit, but not enough to hurt me none. Uh, longitudinal study by Shuha uh, use the nationwide inpatient sample. And this is all the hospital admissions, or most of them, from 1997 to 2014, and evaluating the trends in pancreatitis. And this is very important. So look at the trend line. The trend for uh, the discharges from 2000, uh, from 19, uh, I have difficulty to see it, uh, from 1997 to 2014, look at the market decrease in admissions, significant decrease, 41% decrease in admissions in the United States. Length of stay, significantly decre decrease, but not as much as the number of, uh, rather, discharges, I'm sorry. Uh, <clears throat> but look at the mean charges. The mean charges have gone from 12,000 to 39,000 in 2014. So this is actually how much it costs to treat a patient with chronic pancreatitis when they do get admitted. Uh, and I do want to, um, almost at the conclusion, uh, this is an important study, Inspire, and actually Dr. Bellin is one of the co-authors on the study. And it's one of the studies that talks about the actual direct costs of treatment of children with chronic pancreatitis. The study um, uh, dealt with uh, submission of uh, forms to the physicians taking care of the patients and to the patients. And that data was analyzed, and these are the results. Uh, the condition is uncommon in children, although it is becoming more and more recognizable as, as a distinct entity, and therefore more children are now diagnosed with the disease. Uh, they are accompanied by large disease burden, including pain, emergency room visits, and recurrent hospitalization. Uh, the medical complications are costly with an estimated average annual cost of $40,000 per child per year. And assuming that the incidence is 0.5 to, of, uh, I'm sorry, 0.5 of 100,000 per year for chronic pancreatitis, uh, that uh, probably implies that $330 million will be spent. Uh, by extrapolating this cost from the Inspire registry, pediatric chronic pancreatitis alone may result in approximately $64 million of cost. To summarize our patient, prior to discharge, she had her first solid meals in two years. That was in the hospital. Mm. Uh, she went home. She had her first solid meal at home in two years. Her husband made her lobster. Uh, the pain that she, had got, that she had had for so many years is gone, and she's not on insulin. Now, this is not a happy ever after story because Every, none of these patients, or at least none of the patients that we have seen, um, are all of a sudden miraculously jumping out and you know, returning immediately to their life. Many of them have many, many issues. But at least we have solved that problem 
At least she does not have the pain related to her chronic pancreatitis, and she's not on insulin. And this is the patient who had a partial pancreatectomy already. <clears throat> now, I do want to conclude with a small presentation from Grey's Anatomy. Who here watches Grey's Anatomy? Okay, one, come on, be honest, this for God's Laura sake. Hillrich, I know at least of she one. was diagnosed with hereditary oh, pancreatitis at age Don't five. Stop. She's been hospitalized for the last six months. And why haven't we helped her? A number of criteria need to align in order to perform her surgery. Her Apache 2 score should be below 4. Her MLA's lipase, LDH, and base deficit should be within normal limits. Her fasting glucose and C-peptide levels should all be... All right, low. all right, got it. DeLuca? The hope has always been to do a total pancreatectomy with an eyelid autotransplantation, so she won't get diabetes or even need insulin shots. And today, all the elements have aligned. Your numbers are perfect, Nora. And today, no. we are taking you to surgery. <laughs> oh, you can go back to school. <laughs> How long will I have to recover? Well, I'll be out of here before you know it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much for informed consent. We're taking you to surgery today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to present. Thank you, Dr. Schwartzman. Um, our next speaker uh, couldn't make it today. Um, one of his partner had to leave, from what I understand, for family emergency. So um, we will move on to um, Dr. Renz. Um, this is, after all, a surgery a symposium, so we have to talk a little bit about surgery. Uh, and I apologize to all of our friends from internal medicine that are here. It might be a little bit boring, but if there's one message uh, to take home, it is that there is maybe not one procedure that fits all when it comes to chronic pancreatitis. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. John Renz. Dr. Renz is professor of medicine, and he is the vice chair for program development here at Downstate. Um, he was instrumental in building um, one of the um, um, most prestigious uh, liver transplant programs in New York City at Columbia. He then became a chief of transplantation at the University of Arizona and later was uh, directing the liver transplant program at the University of Chicago. Um, and now he um, has joined us just a few months ago, and he's going to talk about the standard surgical consideration, this treatment of chronic pancreatitis. John? <laughs> well, thank you so much. I'm so sorry. Um, I, you know, I won't want to steal Reiner's thunder, I and mean, he knows this far better than I do, but you know, I will just talk about the, some of the basics of the standard surgical considerations in a treatment of chronic pancreatitis, and I have nothing to disclose. So you know, as we know, you know, chronic pancreatitis is really a progressive inflammatory disease of the pancreas, and it's characterized by irreversible morphologic changes. Here we see a... Here we see a diseased pancreas. It's clearly fibrotic and scarred. And the accumulation of these morphologic changes results in chronic pain and ultimately impedes endocrine and exocrine function of the gland. And the incidence is roughly 15 per 100,000 population, but as we know, that varies dramatically with geography and socioeconomics. So, the etiology of pancreatitis is important, especially for the surgical management, because some of the operations lend themselves better to certain etiologies. And, and while we're all familiar with toxic and metabolic alcohol-related chronic pancreatitis, there's certainly idiopathic, a genetic predisposition to the disease, can be associated with autoimmune diseases, as well as anatomic abnormalities of the pancreas, like pancreas divism. And it's really kind of with all inflammatory diseases, there's really a three-hit hypothesis, which begins with the sentinel acute event. There we go, okay. Uh, which begins with the sentinel acute event or the sentinel acute pancreatitis event. This is usually triggered by some environmental stressor, but can certainly be genetic. And then, of course, there's an inappropriate upregulation of inflammation within the organ and that leads to an overabundance of pancreatic injury and an altered immune response that, consider, that continues this injury pattern, leading to chronic inflammation. And of course, chronic inflammation 
associated with ischemia, glandular ischemia, whether it's the pancreas or the liver uh, or any other, or it's all the same. This results in uh, moving of collagen and fibrotic fibrosis, ultimately leading to pain and then endocrine and exocrine loss function. But the, the, we're all kind of familiar to kind of superficial level with the idea of chronic pancreatitis. But <clears throat> the pain is also associated with glandular dysfunction, so it's commonly associated with weight loss, malabsorption, fatigue, steatorrhea, and then ultimately with loss of endocrine function, diabetes. And, you know, these patients are developing pain in kind of a multi centric modality. Not only do they have pain associated with hypertension within the gland, ductal hypertension, inflammation of the celiac trunk, but then all the physiologic impediment that comes with it kind of accelerates the, their plight. So you have GI dysmotility, poor malabsorption, fatigue, and all this turns into a kind of chronic pain syndrome that is multifactorial in origin. Radiologically, chronic pancreatitis looks like this. This CAT scan has all the classic features, ductal dilatation, calcification within the gland, and pancreatic tissue atrophy. Now, when you look at the inflammation, right, you have complete replacement of normal parenchyma with collagen and scar tissue, right? It begins with a neutrophil infiltration. This causes local ischemia and inflammation. The macrophages move in to kind of clean up the cell debris, and then the lymphocytes uh, result in formation of chronic collagen as they recruit collagen to fill the areas of, of ischemia. When you look at established pancreatitis versus end stage, you certainly have fibrosis, exocrine and endocrine insufficiency, and there's a small incidence of duct-associated adenocarcinoma. And uh, the intrapancreatic complications, and looking at the complications is essential because it's going to help you decide what kind of operation may best suit your patient. And certainly the intrapancreatic complications include duct strictures and stones, which are common, pseudocyst, splenic vein thrombosis uh, with associated portal hypertension, especially uh, peripheral vein uh, uh, thrombosis, which can give kind of localized vascular hypertrophy, venous hypertension, in the field of resection. There's gastric and duodenal outlet obstruction. Often there's an inflammatory mass in the head of the pancreas, which, which um, can be misdiagnosed for uh, adenocarcinoma and requires very careful imaging and workup. Biliary obstruction from, sphinx, from stenosis of the common bile duct, as well as portal vein thrombosis and pancreatic cancer. The extra pancreatic complications are also significant because the pseudocyst can extend into the retroperitoneum or the mediastinum. You can have a duct leak with uh, ascites and fistula formation, metabolic disease, and of course all this predisposes to infection, SIRS, and multi-system organ failure. So when you look at the plight of the unfortunate individual as chronic pancreatitis, you know, it's not uncommon for them to have a persistent chronic history with a lot of narcotic use. They've often failed multiple different therapies by many different providers. And they've also had a lot of treatment options like endoscopy and plus minus even TPN. So you have a patient who really has difficulty both at the physiologic but also at the psychosocial level with respect to gainful employment, intrafamily relations, the entire the entire thing is just a very unfortunate situation. Now, there are multiple um, studies that have conclusively shown that surgery is superior to chronic endoscopy. And perhaps the most famous was a New England Journal of Medicine article that really categorically looked in a prospective randomized trial versus chronic and uh, ERCP therapy versus surgery, uh, drainage procedures in surgery. And it showed a lower pain threshold, approximately double that of endoscopy, with overall improved health on an SF36 form. And there was no difference seen in hospitalization, complications, or pancreatic functions. So for at least the last 10 years, there's very solid data to show that surgery uh, is superior to chronic endoscopy. 
don't know what happened to the slides. Is there? It, there's some. Kind of, hmm. This is a Mac, this is a Mac uh, conversion error. Maybe I'll just see if I can. Now it won't do anything. Okay, that's okay. So ERCP uh, is not is inferior to surgery. So let's talk about some of the most common surgical procedures. Now, one of the slides that is broken basically says that you can categorize the procedures into a drainage procedure, a resection procedure, or a drainage and resection procedure. So we'll go through each of the three categories. I'll give you kind of the historical update. A lot of this surgery hasn't changed for decades and the results are pretty standardized and actually haven't changed much either in the last 20 years. But of course, we all know the Pusteau procedure. Prior to Pusteau, there had been a lot of work with, um, with sphincterotomies, limited resections of the tail of the pancreas, plus minus the spleen, and what were called retrograde drainage procedure. This is Pusto's original paper from 1956, and actually the operation from his paper is not what we historically think of as the Pusto. This is his drawing, and basically at the time there was a lot of work with distal pancreatectomies, including the spleen, plus some form of retrograde drainage procedure. And what Pusto did was not only took a smaller piece of the distal pank, but then he opened up the main duct and then kind of imbricated the intestine, a rulim, over that. So this was Pusto's original description of his operation. And that's a pure drainage procedure. And that was modified into what we characteristically think of as the Pusto by uh, Partington and Rochelle, and this was done in 1960. And instead of doing the distal pancreatectomy and the splenectomy, they preserved the spleen, filleted the main pancreatic duct, and then brought the rulim up to be a side-to-side -side, uh, bowel to pancreas anastomosis, preserving the spleen. So they eliminated the splenectomy, they eliminated the distal pancreatectomy, and they greatly extended the opening of the major uh, pancreatic duct. This is kind of how historically we view the Pusto. And interestingly, the first uh, long-term results of the Pusto were actually reported by uh, Irving Enquest and Duval. And Enquest was a faculty member, actually, at Sunny Downstate. So, you know, coming across the literature, how could you not um, include um, talking a little bit about downstate and its role in uh, chronic pancreatitis. And this was uh, published in 1961. So at the end, the, the upside of the Pusto is that it's a limited drainage procedure for principally major ductal disease and not head of the pancreas disease, which as you know is typically the site of most of the inflammation and pathology. So it's thought kind of that the head of the pancreas is the motor or the uh, driver for pancreatic pain and often the area of its principal inflammation. So if you have distal disease, isolated disease, certainly the Pusto has applicability. Another upside is it's rather easy to do. It's been done open, it's been done laparoscopic, it's been done robotically. There are multiple papers in each one of these modalities, all of which show similar results but it has very limited efficacy, with a better results actually achieved in children historically um, than in adults. Now, away from the kind of isolated drainage is the pure resection pancreati pancreatectomy, right? And here, you can either have a distal pancreatectomy, which we see here, right? You can have a Whipple, right? Or you can have a total pancreatectomy. And the, the, uh, the kind of the advantage of the Whipple is when you have a lot of extra pancreatic manifestations of the, the disease. So for example, you may have get persistent gastric outlet obstruction, you may have stenosis of the duodenum, you may have um, cholestasis secondary to a biliary stricture. So when you're having extra pancreatic manifestations, then certainly the Whipple is a useful tool for head of the pancreas disease, which includes an inflammatory mass in the head of the pancreas. The distal pancreatectomy has really limited applicability and has been kind of receding from the uh, general surgeon's armamentarium for chronic pancreatitis. 
Of course, when you talk about the Pusteau and you combine the drainage plus the resection, that gives you two very common uh, procedures, one called the Berger and the other called the Frey, right? The Berger is typically favored by the Europeans and the Frey has been typically favored uh, by the uh, North Americans. And basically you see both of them here, but I'll go into detail uh, much more in a moment. And basically the Frey is technically much easier, right? What you do is you basically do a Pusteau and then you extend that incision to include the anterior component of the head of the pancreas, and then you use your rule limb to kind of drain the entire pancreas, including the head and the major duct. Um, the Berger is a little bit different in that they actually resect the head of the pancreas and then use the same rule limb in a much more sophisticated reconstruction, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. So starting with the easy, uh, the Frey procedure uh, was reported by Charles Frey. It was in 1987 in the Annals of Surgery. This is his original paper. And here were the results that he obtained in a, in a, in a cohort of 50 patients. 75% had relief of pain. 11% postoperatively had progression of their diabetes. 64% increased weight. And he described post-surgical narcotic utilization as minimal. Uh, but without a, without a number. And here you can kind of see, by extending the kind of classic Pusteau to include the head of the pancreas, you then set up a target for the arulim to completely drain the organ. Uh, uh, within the very same period of time, Berger produced these results, which are almost identical to uh, Frey. And, and it's arguable who was first. Berger was probably first by a year or two, but in the strict ordering of sequence, technically Frey was ahead of him, but certainly Berger had been doing this prior and for longer than Frey had been, and Berger is a German. Of course, Frey was in the United States. But when you look at his operation, this is his original drawing, and it shows what the goal of the Berger is, and that is to preserve the duodenum with a small rim of pancreatic tissue. Here's your common bile duct your pancreatic duct and your major pancreatic duct. So this is going to be his target for the rule limb, which as you can see is a lot more sophisticated, a lot more complicated than the Frey procedure. And what he did in his series, his series was triple what Frey's was and published within two years of each other. And what he did is on two thirds of the patients, roughly 75 to 80 patients, he did the rule limb to completely enclose both the distal pancreas, biliary tree, and major pancreatic duct. And in another 25% of patients, he extended that and extended a pusteau onto them and extended the rule limb up even further. And just to quickly go back, you can see that he essentially um, produced almost the identical results. So the question really became, which one do you use, right? And there were a series of at least four different prospective randomized trials trying to figure out which one was better, the Berger or the Frey. And the bottom line is it depends on the center and it depends on the principal surgeon's experience. As one could imagine, you know, uh, the people who did the Berger were quite gifted technically, and as a result, they tended to have um, better results um, than the fray. And even when you looked at the Berger versus the Whipple procedure for inflammatory head of the pancreas results, the Berger always came up in single center studies uh, better than the Whipple, both for length of time, blood loss, minor improvement in hospitalization. So, but again, these were all isolated centers with a lot of uh, performer bias, a lot of surgeon bias. So the kind of best paper to come out came out last year in the Lancet, and it basically was an 18-center uh, European study that compared the Whipple uh, versus the Berger principally. And what it showed was there were 250 patients across 18 centers, and at the end of the day, there was no significant difference between the total pancreatic procedure and the partial pancreatic oduodenectomy uh, between the groups. So at the end, any one of these techniques actually is, can be tailored to the patient 
to deliver relatively similar results depending upon what you find, how much extra pancreatic disease there have and where the, where the disease is within the pancreas. So that's a lot and a little bit of time, but the bottom line is that the operative therapy is clearly superior to medical therapy for uh, chronic pancreatitis. And it really requires an approach tailored to the patient. Overall, the results ha are what they are. They're not, they're not particularly good over the last 30 years, but in individual cases, particularly the alcoholics of which most of these studies were the major cohort, you know, uh, cessation of alcohol plus surgery may uh, deliver results that are reasonable in about two-thirds of the patients. However, with respect to the genetics, the autoimmunes, and the uh, idiopathics, you know, much more radical uh, procedures are necessary to completely remove the pancreas. The anatomic location certainly is helpful in planning your operation via a drainage or drainage plus resection procedure, as is the overall health status of the patient, with the pusto being the least morbid of the group. Again, it's really tailored, specific therapy, and the most important take-home point, I think, is, is you have to consider all these historic operations in the context of current technology with respect to auto eyelid, because every one of these is going to substantially impact or negate even the ability to recover islet cells since that sur after that surgery is complete. So with that, um, I hope I've laid the table for talking about total pancreatectomy with auto islet, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I'm good. Good morning and welcome to this uh, wonderful conference. My name is Dr. Salifu. I'm the chair of medicine, and I work very closely with uh, Dr. Gusna. <laughs> Uh, moving forward, we have a very strong alliance and strategic goal to work together to improve the services at uh, SUNY Downstate Medical Center. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my great friend who is a world-renowned surgeon. Uh, he has described many techniques in uh, pancreatic surgery uh, in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, he's well known across the United States in that field uh, of kidney transplantation, uh, pancreas transplantation and liver transplantation. We were fortunate to get him after a brilliant career at um, uh, the University of Minnesota. Later on, he went to uh, Arizona uh, University Medical Center, where he was very, very successful, uh, and then to upstate our sister institution at uh, Syracuse. And now we are fortunate to have him to lead our program at Downstate. So today, he's going to be addressing um, Dr. Grusner, your topic. He's going to be addressing pancreatectomy and islet autotransplantation, uh, TPIAT. Welcome to the podium. Thank you, uh, Dr. Salifu. Um, I may mean, just want to make one brief comment. Um, it is rare to have uh, both the chairs of medicine and surgery um, have a common interest, and that is transplantation. Um, and this is really to uh, the good of this institution because I have worked under different circumstances where the chairs of surgery and medicine were fighting, and uh, that was not good for the institution. So um, I'm very grateful um, that we have Dr. Salifu here to lead uh, um, uh, the, the collaboration with us, I mean, in, in uh, nephrology, hepatology, endocrinology and so forth. So I'm going back to briefly to what Dr. Wren said because that's a good segue. Um, there are only three things that are important, again, primarily for our uh, medical students and the residents, and these are in red. Uh, just keep in mind, chronic pancreatitis is a progressive disease. It is irreversible. No matter what happens, the patient may come back to you and say, well, I'm doing fine, and he or she may do fine for a few weeks, maybe a few months, even for a few years but eventually it will be a progressive disease. And what is so disabling is the chronic pain syndrome that is really crippling uh, uh, both uh, physically and psychologically to these patients. Um, we talked about that uh, uh, parenchymal destruction and so forth, but that is not the main reason to do a total pancreatectomy. It is, in fact, the chronic pain syndrome that we are dealing with. 
Now, why have surgeons not embraced um, total pancreatectomy? It is considered a radical therapy for a benign disease. It's obviously not a cancer. Um, and it results in complete endocrine and exocrine insufficiency. And I will talk about that um, later. The surgical induced diabetes is different than type 1 diabetes because the organ does not only not produce insulin, but also no glucagon and none of the other pancreatic hormones. But it does relieve pain, there's no doubt about it, much more so than what we see with the Whipple procedure or the distal pancreatectomy or any of these combined procedures. Because once you leave diseased tissue behind, the pain will recur. So islet autotransplantation, which is offered only at few institutions still throughout the United States because it requires investment on part of institutions to build a, a laboratory to make it happen, a laboratory staff, someone who directs the laboratory and so forth. But islet autotransplantation, if done simultaneously or shortly subsequently to the procedure, preserves beta cell function and minimizes or prevents uh, uh, the development of diabetes mellitus. Now, TPIAT is not a one-man show. It requires an entire team, and it's shown here. I mean, from nursing staff in the, I, in the OR, ICU, and so forth, and obviously, I mean, um, all kinds of physicians uh, through, throughout different fields um, beneath the lab. And then we also, what is equally important, I need to follow up our patients. Many of these patients come from other parts of the country to us to have the procedure done here, and uh, we owe it to them. Uh, follow up so that, I mean, they continue to do well over time. And the same is true in the operating room. Again, this is not a one-man show. It involves an entire team. Um, we do um, uh, portal vein pressurements interoperatively uh, when we infuse. And I also will talk uh, in a minute about um, real-time interoperative ultrasound and Doppler studies. Now, how do we do uh, total pancreatectomies, we can do them open, or we do them minimally invasively, and that is not laparoscopically, that is robotically, and I'll tell you in a minute why that is. Now, the, the open procedure, open pancreatectomy, is very standardized. Um, one of my former um, uh, faculty, Dr. Desai, introduced um, one um, element that was not described before, the so-called sling maneuver. But in, in, in summary, the way we do the open technique is we remove the entire pancreas on block, so we do not divide uh, the neck and then give two pieces of pancreatic tissue to the, uh, to the laboratory. We try to remove the entire gland. We preserve, and this is obviously completely different than for cancer operations, where you go after the blood vessels uh, first to avoid any dissemination of tumor cells. We preserve until the very end the inflow vessels, so the gastroduodenal and splenic arteries and the outflow vessel, that is the splenic vein. And um, we try to preserve the spleen whenever we can. Now, this is what we described in the literature as the sling maneuver, <clears throat> and it really uh, um, helps us to um, much easier uh, sever the uncinate process from the superior mesenteric vessels, because as you know, sometimes the border between superior mesenteric vessels uh, and, and uncinate process, as well as retropancreatic connective tissue is difficult to define. So what we do is, is we put a Penrose drain across the neck or underneath the neck of the pancreas along the superior mesenteric vessels, and then we swing the upper portion of the Penrose drain underneath the gastroduodenal artery and um, the bile duct in order, and that is shown in a second. This is the preparation. This is the, the Penrose drain here. The uh, uh, upper portion is then um, um, pulled underneath the gastroduodenal artery and the bile duct toward the right side of the patient. This is how it looks, and now you can see how nicely the Penrose drain actually allows uh, the separation between the uncinate process and the retropancreatic tissue, and you just basically do that with the cautery or the um, harmonic scalpel, depending on what technique you are using um, along the uncinate process. Uh, this is a um, slide that shows you one of these... Uh, um, pancreatic before it's, it's removed, splenic artery, uh, gastroduodenal artery, the splenic vein, obviously you cannot see. The uh, uh, spleen is left intact. You may wonder why are they taking a um, seemingly normal pancreas out. Um, about 15% of all patients with chronic pancreatitis have minimal change disease or small ductal disease, and the pancreas looks more or less normal. And it's, again, the pain and the fact that these patients are already on exocrine um, substitution, enzyme substitution, that makes it so difficult. 
This is how it looks after the pancreas is removed, the splenic artery, the splenic vein, uh, the splenic vein, the gastroduodenal artery are all clamped, so is the bile duct for the um, uh, reconstruction. Um, <clears throat> in some cases, um, we always try to preserve the spleen. In cases where we find an accessory spleen, and we had a few of these patients who were more liberal, and we removed the spleen because these accessory spleens tend to grow over time and um, take over the function when it comes to the avoidance of the abscess syndrome of a regular spleen. Now, there's also a big difference when we do a total pancreatectomy uh, for chronic pancreatitis. As you can see, the cava, the order, the portal vein, um, you can see them, but they are not cleaned. This is a cancer operation, um, how we do them, where basically all the lymph nodes um, along the vena cava, the portal vein, the aorta, the superior mesenteric artery, and so forth, are all taken away. So it's a big difference um, doing a total pancreatectomy for chronic pancreatitis or for cancer. This is how it um, most of the time looks like. Uh, this is a completion pancreatectomy. Pancreas looks like a rock, is a rock. And yes, you can imagine it's very difficult to identify any cells in there that are used uh, for the islet autotransplant uh, part of the procedure. There are more examples of that. The pancreas, as Dr. Renz already mentioned, is very atrophic most of the time or completely fibrotic, as shown on the um, right side of the slide. Now, the procedure is done in such a way that, that we do the operation. We remove the, uh, the, the pancreas. We hand it over. While that is taking place, the uh, uh, GI reconstruction takes place. It usually takes a little bit longer for the islets to come back. Or if we ship out the, the pancreas uh, to a remote facility, then we close the patient first, and then the following day we do the um, um, islet infusion. Now, this is how it was done in Arizona. Um, this was um, uh, described by Horacio Arillo, who is in the, in the audience. Um, he was the first one to bring telemedicine into uh, um, the structure of this procedure in that we had um, a monitor um, in the operating room to see what was going on in the laboratory. And he, on the other hand, could see in the laboratory what we were doing. So we really could um, um, uh, optimally time I mean, what the construction, reconstruction, and how it was done, whereas, I mean, he would concentrate on the islet isolation. Now, as I said, the total pancreatectomy is um, immediately followed by the GI reconstruction, and that is done um, in standard fashion with a duodenal jejunostomy and hepatico jejunostomy. And then the islet infusion um, is usually started in that we uh, measure the baseline portal vein pressure, which is anywhere between 7 and 10 millimeters um, Hg. Now, it can shoot up in the 30 or 40 range, and that can give rise to portal vein thrombosis, a rare um, but um, a very serious complication when it occurs. Um, we give heparin throughout so that these islets that clock, I mean, the small vanules in the liver do not cause, I mean, uh, um, damage to the point that, that you end up with portal vein thrombosis. We do not usually infuse directly in the portal vein because if we do that and put a figure of eight uh, suture around the, the injection site, um, it could cause possibly a stenosis or narrowing of the vein. And then we always, um, at the end of the procedure, if we preserve the spleen, we take a look at it just to make sure everything is good. <clears throat> we have recently embarked on real-time intraoperative um, on Doppler ultrasound. This shows you the blood vessel, the portal vein, and now look the white stuff in there. These are the eyes, and you don't even see a Doppler signal. So this is real-time um, while we're doing the infusion, and what that allows us to do is, is even before we measure the uh, portal vein pressure, um, we are able to also look at the Doppler signal of the portal vein. And by doing so, again, if we start this here, you'll see it in a second, we can actually get the signal of the portal vein. And by doing so, before the pressure goes up, we can adjust the rate and the, the flow uh, and the ease of the transfusion. Here, this is uh, obviously not, not an optimal um, uh, recording, but it does show that we can really see any kind of changes with regard to hepatic vein flow and then adjust um, the flow rate as needed. And then here, this I think is a longer clip, it, it really shows the same. And, and Robert, if you go more to the middle of uh, the, and, and forward a little bit toward the middle of the entire clip, right there, yeah, if, yeah just forward a little bit. Um, you will see that we are also, at the same time, 
getting Doppler signals uh, of the hepatic artery and the hepatic vein. And we haven't done that in many patients yet. Uh, this was actually introduced by Dr. Sorens and Schwartzman during the procedure. <clears throat> um, the hepatic artery flow pattern, the Doppler flow pattern, and the hepatic vein flow pattern is not um, any different um, as you would expect. Now, if you have portal vein thrombosis, however, you would see, or uh, um, the starting symptoms of portal vein thrombosis, you would see an increase in hepatic artery flow, which we have not seen. Because if the portal vein, as you know, even shows partial thrombosis, the hepatic artery will take over and increase, uh, and, and there will be a, um, a much greater um, upstroke than uh, without it. So <clears throat> uh, these are some of the results that we had back um, um, during my time in Arizona, and again, um, the people that were really um, uh, heavily involved in that program were um, uh, Dr. Rilo and his wife, uh, Renee, as well as Dr. Desai and Rana, as, and then on the general surgery side, Dr. Galvani. <clears throat> we performed a number of robotic um, procedures, um, in about 10% closer to the end of the initial experience, but what you can also see on this slide is, is that these patients are complicated with regard to the number of previous pancreatic surgeries, ERCPs, or all kinds of abdominal surgeries. As you know, most patients with chronic pancreatitis undergo a cholecystectomy before anything else is done. So why did we do it robotically and not laparoscopically? The answer is easy. Uh, the flexibility and the movement of the instruments is much more um, delicate with a robot than it is with a laparoscope. And it really has enabled um, uh, more and more general surgeons to do pancreas surgery using the robotic rather than laparoscopic uh, techniques. Laparoscopic techniques are clearly the way to go when it comes to cholecystectomy or to uh, colon cases and so forth. But when it comes to liver and to pancreatic minimal invasive resection, the robot is clearly um, superior to laparoscopic techniques. Um, uh, Dr. Galvani was the one who described the first case. Um, and again, the technique, uh, we adopted the same as we did it with the open technique, uh, the removal of the entire pancreas, preservation of the blood flow, and then the spleen preservation until the very end. This is the setup. These are the three trocars, the five millimeter trocars of the Da Vinci robot, as shown here. And there might be more changes coming over the next few years now, as other companies are now developing new robots and I think maybe in 10, 15 years, we're actually at a stage where we don't have the robots outside anymore, but where, I mean, the instruments are all inside the abdomen of the patient. I mean, a number of companies have engaged in, uh, in this uh, development, and I think within 10, 15 years, we will see <clears throat> much more um, movement in that regard than, uh, than what had happened over the last 15 years, where the Da Vinci robot really uh, was the only way to do it. So three um, trocars for the Da Vinci, and then we have two trocars um, for the camera, and a working port is shown here, 12 millimeters, and then the uh, pancreas is removed through a fan and steel incision. This shows the whole setup um, in the OR. Uh, we now have, obviously, the Da Vinci with, uh, with uh, um, two chairs and uh, two consoles. Um, assisting surgeon is still on the side of the patient, and then, obviously, a scrub nurse. So we enter through the lesser sac, take care of the stomach and the liver, as shown here, and pull them in a cephalate position. Then we get down to the uh, tail of the pancreas, as shown here, free it up towards the, here's uh, the, the liver and the, uh, the uh, stomach retractor. We go toward the tail of the pancreas. We isolate the splenic artery and splenic vein. We divide them with the, uh, um, with the stapler. Then we move uh, retroperitoneally towards the confluence between splenic vein here and portal vein. We dig out the splenic artery. And then after that, we stay on the upper margin of the pancreas towards the uh, portal vein, <clears throat> as you can see here, and uh, the common bile duct as well as the gastroduodenal artery. Once, um, gastroduodenal artery, once all of that is done, we uh, do the coca maneuver, as shown here, and we free up the first uh, loop of uh, jejunum. Um, when that is done, we uh, divide the uh, first portion of the duodenum about two or three inches below the splenic, uh, below the pylorus. The uh, vessels are then divided, as is the bile duct, as you uh, could see. Then the specimen is handed over to 
of the laboratory. We do the um, biliodigestive hepatico jejunostomy in standard fashion, as we also do a um, uh, duodeno jejunostomy. Now, in contrast to the open procedures, this is not one loop. We actually divide that loop um, between the um, gastro or the duodeno jejunostomy and the hepatico jejunostomy so that we end up with two um, um, RU and Y loops. And these two RU and Y loops are then at the end um, sutured together. This is again the jejuno jejunostomy or preparation of the two jejuno jejunostomy. When all of that is done, we infuse the eyelids into the splenic vein stump as shown here. When all that is done, we take one more look at the splenic, <coughs> at the spleen itself, and that um, summarizes in two and a half minutes what actually takes 10 to 12 hours. Um, <clears throat> it's a long procedure. <clears throat> so in a couple of patients, we had to remove the spleen. Sometimes you leave the spleen in, you still have to go back and remove it because it does not survive. But in most patients, we are actually able to keep the um, spleen in. The robotic um, procedure is safe and feasible. The uh, robotic approach allows for safe vascular dissection. Um, now, there is no doubt that the OR time initially is longer, um, not significantly, as you can see here. But this is a 10-hour operation. This is an 11 or 12-hour operation. But what it does, I mean, just look at the mean length of stay. Despite, I mean, an operation of 12 hours, patients on average are going home within 11 days. Now, <clears throat> why? Are we still struggling with, even if we have enough eyelids, uh, with the fact that not all patients, and I'll show you in a second, um, that not all patients are insulin independent? Why are we struggling with that? Because, I mean, you obviously take these eyelids out. Now, there's one thing, obviously, to say, and Dr. Apakalai will go into more detail, because these pancreas are all diseased. But on average, I mean, you have anywhere between 500,000 and a million eyelids in the pancreas, um, the majority, 60%, in the tail of the pancreas. So how come that they don't all work? Now, the liver, after all, is not a friendly environment when it comes to islands. Um, there are, there are uh, co uh, coagulation factors. There's complement. There are cytokines. There's nitric oxide. There are macrophages, dendritic cells, kupfer cells, all, all um, entities that, that, I mean, once something that does not belong into the liver is attacked. And that's what happens. And then, obviously, every islet has its own inflow and outflow vessel in the pancreas. We put it in the liver, and it sits in one of these hepatic uh, veins. And <clears throat> there, is, there is no, no inflow and outflow vessel anymore. So I mean, these islets have to, to survive, basically, by diffusion. Then there's islet cell apoptosis. We also lose about half of all the islets during the isolation process. Again, that will be the topic of the next talk. Um, there is ischemia reperfusion injury. Um, uh, then we also um, have to um, uh, deal with um, beta cell exhaustion after, t after some, some time. So there are many, many components that make it very tr tricky. Um, this shows you the results that uh, uh, Horacio Rilo and I had in Arizona. As you can see, insulin independence was seen only in one-third, true insulin independence, only one-third of the patients in a uh, little more than one-third um, patients required less than 10 units of insulin. And we also, I mean, even if a patient required only one or two units, I mean, we did not consider that as complete insulin independence. But then there were almost one third of the patients that required more than 10 uh, uh, units of insulin per day. Now, what are the factors associated with insulin independence? Uh, there are many, like um, high islet yield, high islet mass, no prior pancreatic surgery, uh, no calcification, young recipient, a short duration of disease. The key, the key is early referral. Don't wait until the patient becomes diabetic, develops exocrine insufficient, and so forth. Once the diagnosis has been made, I mean, there is no reason, I mean, to continue with ongoing stent placements and ERCP. We had one patient who had over 60, over 60 ERCPs. Just think of that. You know, I mean, just the idea of having one ERCP is painful. But can you imagine having 60 of them and nothing really works? And then, I mean, the things go on. I mean, the patient undergoes a cholecystectomy, which doesn't help. Then the next thing is, oh, well, resect the, uh, uh, the head of the pancreas or the tail of the pancreas doesn't help. And then in the end, I mean, there's very little left that we can do when it comes to eyelid autotransplantation. Now, this is also a slide of Horacio Rilos, which shows the glucose 
uh, the continuous glucose monitoring, which is completely normal in a patient who received um, a functioning islet transplant. This is in a patient who did not get uh, an islet transplant. And this is what I meant uh, when I earlier said that surgical induced diabetes is a much more brittle form of diabetes than what we usually see in type 1 diabetics. Now, not everyone obviously can undergo um, an islet auto transplant. In our series, we had about 60 patients who underwent an islet transplant and 20% that did not. And this is the difference in survival. Now, <clears throat> And, and we followed out only for two years. But if you go out longer, this is the real problem. It's hypoglycemic episodes and hypoglycemic uh, unawareness. And I'm sure uh, Dr. Robertson may uh, um, talk about that uh, in a little bit more detail later. But what it really means is, is that, that patients do not sense blood sugars um, if they are less than 30 or 40 or even uh, uh, 30, 40 or, or even less than that. But these are the rates that are associated with hypoglycemic unawareness and hypoglycemic uh, unawareness. The mortality rates are anywhere between 2 and 10% per year. Now, you extrapolate that with a number of years, and you understand why Dr. Schwartzman was saying that the mortality for patients with chronic pancreatitis at 10%, uh, at, at 10 years is about 10%, uh, at 20 years is 55%, and that is true for those patients that undergo uh, total pancreatectomies. Now, what can we do in those patients? And we are going full circle because I said that our institution wants to be um, the most comprehensive uh, institution when it comes to the treatment of diabetes. You can do a pancreas transplant. And as you know, pancreas transplants in diabetic patients, in truly diabetic patients, type 1 diabetics or type 2 diabetic patients, um, are done for the treatment of diabetes mellitus. If you do a pancreas transplant in patients with chronic pancreatitis, you not only cure the endocrine, insufficiency, but also the exocrine insufficiency. Now, we haven't talked a lot about that, and most patients usually are well controlled with enzyme uh, uh, replacement, but not all of them. I mean, many of the patients, oh, I shouldn't say many, but about 40% of the patients require frequent changes in uh, the types of pancreatic enzymes that they take um, or um, a combination of different enzymes. So we can do a um, pancreas transplant alone, uh, um, and as many of you know, uh, of you know, um, we we have the duodenum attached, and we attach that to the native bowel, and by doing so, the exocrine insufficiencies is cured as well. Um, we got approval from the uh, Department of Health here in New York um, uh, just late in last year, in November, December. We have done four of these procedures. The first two, as you can see here are completely off insulin with great hemoglobin A1C levels. The fourth patients also had uh, uh, very good islet equivalence, as shown here, and a C-peptide after surgery, similar to the ones that are completely off insulin, but he still remains on insulin. We don't know, I mean, what the reasons are, but we have seen sometimes six, eight, 12 months later that suddenly these islets kick in. We don't know why that is. We have a poor understanding still about the pathophysiology of these uh, cells that lodge in the in the liver, but I mean, we have seen that. This is a patient uh, where we are actually proud to get 125,000 islets from. It was one of these fibrotic um, pancreas that I showed you before. I thought, I mean, we wouldn't get any um, islets. Um, and, uh, um, and Dr. Apakalai is probably one, maybe the best uh, um, per, um, iso isolationist in the country. And um, we got 125,000 back. And this patient is actually on less um, islets currently than the patient who got 400,000. So, I mean, there's still a lot of room for research, I mean, to continue. This is the first patient that, that we did that uh, Dr. Schwartzman had described, and I won't uh, go into any more detail. But what we always do is, is we get biopsies at the end of the procedure of the right and the left lobe, as shown here. And you can see these islets, I mean, sitting there right inside the liver tissue. In that particular case, this patient came off TPN 10 days after the procedure, after not having been able to eat anything for over two years. Now, not always can we do total pancreatectomies. This was one of our most recent cases. As you can see, a patient with bad chronic pancreatitis, and uh, uh, Dr. Schwartzman and Ransom were also um, in that case because we suddenly realized we had seen enlarged lymph nodes before, so we went in, we sent the lymph nodes out, and what came back was um, pancre uh, metastases of pancreatic adenocancer. So there was infiltration, actually, of the hepatic artery and the SMA, and we had to 
back off. Um, we were considering doing a uh, um, um, uh, conduits of the SMA and SMV, but as you all know, when it comes to pancreatic cancer, I think it has become apparent now that these patients require adjuvant and new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy first with two drugs uh, now. The results have shown that it's better to postpone the surgery until that can be done successfully. The real question is, is even if the pancreatic cancer looks good and there are portion of the pancreas that do not um, carry any of the pancreas cells, is it safe to isolate cells and put them in the liver with a potential risk of risking hepatic metastases? Now, in summary, um, total pancreatectomy with added autotransplant is associated with a low surgical mobility and mortality. I didn't go into the detail there. We know robotic, uh, uh, the robotic procedure is, is, is feasible. What is also important is, is even if you don't get the patient completely off insulin, and I showed you uh, the results earlier, if these patients are on uh, um, um, relatively small doses of insulin, what we don't see are the wide excursions usually that you see in brittle diabetics or in surgically induced diabetes. So even a total islet mass of whatever 30, 40,000 cells will ameliorate the symptoms of diabetes and make it easier for the patients to be on insulin. Um, this here is a topic uh, that Dr. Berlin will, will talk about later in much more detail. Um, Again, what is key is the early referral um, in order to achieve insulin independence. Patients that are diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis should go to a center that does total pancreatectomy and offers some um, added autotransplantation at the same time. For those patients where it cannot be done, obviously a pancreas transplant might be um, um, uh, an option. And it's slowly evolving the TPIAT as the gold standard in the surgical treatment of chronic pancreatitis and chronic pain syndrome. Uh, there's also evidence that more and more of the surgical textbooks now actually have chapters on TPIAT, which was unheard of even in the 1990s. So the, the procedure is slowly, slowly um, um, uh, getting um, acceptance. Uh, this is how patients really feel about their pancreas. This is a patient that, uh, um, that we recently did, and it really had completely crippled her life in terms of not being able to work anymore, not having normal interaction with her family and everything else. And I'll show this, uh, this patient of Dr. Rilos and mine. Hi, I'm Whitney Yates, and I'm a patient of Some Dr. Rilos. Some of you have seen it, but I think it's so characteristic of what these and patients go I through. So that's again for the one that have not seen it. Today, it's a good summary. So that you can hear a real life experience um, from somebody that had the TPAIT and how I'm doing now. My story started in 2009. I was 23. I had never been sick before in my life. I'd never been to a hospital. I'd never had any sort of medical crisis. And I was living in San Diego and came down with something terrible. Didn't know what it was. Went to the emergency room and they said, your pancreas is inflamed. Did you drink any alcohol last night or eat any high fat food? And I said, well, yes, I did. I had two vodka cranberries and a burrito. It was Valentine's Day and I had gone out with some friends. And they said, oh, well, that's why this happened. You need to never eat high fat food again and you need to never drink alcohol again. Anytime you do, it can set your pancreas off. After spending 14 days in the hospital with that attack, um, I came home and I followed everything they said. I didn't have a sip of alcohol. I didn't eat anything with fat. And I got sick again. Went into the emergency room, same thing. Have you been drinking? No, I wasn't an alcoholic. I didn't have an alcohol problem, but for some reason that's all the focus was on is the food and the drink. After I got home from that attack, I never recovered again. So I moved back to Arizona where my family was from and continued seeing every GI specialist I could find. Uh, the, the last GI specialist wanted to take out my gallbladder, so we did that. And he was certain that that was the issue that was causing all my problems and that once it was gone, I'd be better. So we did the gallbladder, then we started doing stints and ERCPs, nothing was working. I was at the point where I was in the hospital every week with an attack, going to the emergency room all the time. My mom and I flew to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota because I had heard that they were really good with pancreatic diseases. The doctor said it's progressive, you're not gonna get better, your pancreas is damaged, and it's just gonna keep going. So I left that appointment really discouraged and didn't really know what to do. At that point I weighed 90 pounds, I'm five foot nine. Um, I was withering away, I couldn't eat anything, and anything I did eat would set me into an attack. 
So I came back to Arizona and I went to the Mayo Clinic here and met with a geneticist. She said, you have PRSS1, you have SPINK1, and you also have CFTR mutation. And these are causing your pancreatitis. So I met a woman on Facebook that I had surgery at the U of A with Dr. Grusner. So I went for a consultation and I met the requirements for the surgery based on the condition of my pancreas and the genetics and all of that. So after much deliberation, I mean, it wasn't a, an instant process, we decided to go forward with the surgery. My surgery day was February 16th, 2012. At that point, I was in and out of the hospital every week. Uh, couldn't do anything, had to quit my job, living with my parents, and I was desperate for anything to fix the problem. So my surgery was, I believe, 14 hours, but a lot of it was the getting the eyelids out and all of that. I remember saying to Dr. Grusner, what's the worst thing that happens? It's just diabetes. And he said, no, it's not just diabetes. It's gonna change your whole life. It's gonna be a big pain in the butt forever. You're gonna have highs, you're gonna have lows, you're gonna have an insulin pump. You know, he explained the, the severity of diabetes, which was good because it set the expectation that that's what could happen. And it did end up happening. My barometer for success was, I wanna get off the narcotic pain medication that I'm on every day. I was on fentanyl pain patches, oxycodone, you name it, I was taking it, and I wanted to live pain-free. I wanted to be out of the hospital. And that is success to me, and I achieved that success. And part of the reason I was able to do that is that I had a team here in Phoenix that the U of A set me up with, Dr. Grusner and Dr. Rillo had set me up with, a pain management doctor, and I would go to him weekly, and he would help me step down. And it was a gradual, I would say, nine-month process and it felt so wonderful to be off everything, no longer relying on anything to get through a day and just being healthy again. Um, so I think that the diabetes and the pain medication were two things that people usually use to indicate success of the surgery. Um, diabetes to me was a trade-off that was worth it. I would do it again every single day. 2012, I have not been in the hospital one day since I left my surgery. So when they discharged me from that surgery after I think it was 14 days or something like that, I have not been back in the hospital at all for a single day. So a little bit about what life looks like today for me. Um, the surgery was 2012. In 2014, I met my husband. I was finally able to go out and date people and live my life again. Um, I started my real estate career. Uh, I actually started it right before my illness and then it took off after my illness. So I've been doing real estate successfully in my area for five years and um, I'm expecting our first child in January of 2017. So I'm finally getting to live life to the fullest and enjoy every day and I think after you've experienced something like I had in the past, you, you never forget how lucky you are to be doing what you're doing. So I'm truly living my dreams and it's all because I had the surgery that saved my life. I owe so much to Dr. Grusner. Okay, so, so, so I must disclose I had nothing to do with that video. It showed up on YouTube one day, and I keep showing it because, I mean, if you look at what toll the disease had taken on that young woman, on Whitney, and how she looked before she underwent the surgery, I mean, you realize what it can mean. Now, <clears throat> this um, YouTube clip has been clicked on thousands of times because, I mean, as you know, we live in the time of social media, and everyone, I mean, is on social media. There are big blogs um, from patients that have chronic pancreatitis. They go back and forth. And uh, they sometimes travel wide distances to go to the program that they entrust their lives with. And um, we should always be grateful to these patients that for what reason ever they are choosing us, whether, whether the program here or in Minnesota or, or, any, or in, 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 in Kentucky, any place, um, these people are desperate, but they're looking at, I mean, what other patients with chronic pancreatitis are going through. We just redid parts of our Department of Surgery website. We are um, not even um, um, close to being done, but we revised the one on TPIT, and we have a few more patient testimonials there that show you, I mean, how treacherous this disease is. Now, this disease cannot be compared with diabetes, where we have 30 million diabetics in the country. Um, we have only 100 or 200, maybe 300,000 of patients with chronic pancreatitis. But interestingly enough, the treatment is very similar. It's added 
transplantation. And it shows you, I mean, how it can impact, I mean, both diseases that are rampant and a disease that is relatively rare. So I'll stop here and uh, we'll continue with the program. It's always good to hear from the master himself. So that's really very good. Uh, and for the medical students in the audience, you see what originality can bring. Um, all this stuff that he's showing some of the stuff he actually uh, described uh, for the first time in the literature. So this is very good, and thank you. So our next speaker is going to uh, address uh, isolation of islet cells. His name is uh, Dr. Uh, Balamurugan Apakalai. Dr. Apakalai is associate professor at the University of Louisville in Kentucky, uh, and he's a director of the Center for Cellular Transplantation. He has done over 1,000 islet cell isolations, another 1,000, you know, pick, you know, pancreas islet cell isolation, and a whole lot of stuff. Uh, in the country right now, he's one of the best uh, who is able to uh, isolate the, the, the cells at a very, very high quality. So we're very lucky to have him to participate in this conference, and please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Good morning, everybody. As an islet lab director, I would like to share with you how I process human pancreas to isolate the human islet cells for both auto transplantation as well as allo transplantation for type 1 diabetic patients. So my surgeon removed the pancreas in the hospital. I take the pancreas to my clean room facility, which is registered under FDA. Uh, it's, a, it's a dedicated clean room GMP facility, good manufacturing facility. We process the pancreas, it takes uh, four to five hours time with the four to five members team and return the islet cells back to the patient. So isolating large quantities of high quality islets from every processed pancreas is absolutely necessary for a successful islet autotransplantation program because achieving long-term insulin independence after islet autotransplantation primarily depending upon how many islets we transplant. So many published studies reported that, so the strong in, in, independent risk factor for islet graft failure was low islet yield. So my goal is always try to achieve maximum number of islet cells from every processed pancreas. Extracting islet cells from chronic pancreatitis pancreas is somewhat a specialized technique when compared to isolating islet cells from brain dead donor pancreas, which we, which we do for our islet allo transplantation to type one diabetic patients. Uh, because of the structural changes, it's difficult to isolate islet cells from chronic pancreatitis pancreas. If you compare the grass morphology of brain-dead donor pancreas with chronic, chronic pancreatitis pancreas, you could appreciate the difference. It is difficult to isolate islets from these ones, hence uh, islet yield remains a problem in islet autotransplantation. As you see here, isolating islet cells from chronic pancreatitis pancreas poses multiple challenges, alteration in ductal structure, calcification in ducts, and the accumulation of fibrous layers in the pancreatic parenchyma can significantly hinder the ability to inject tissue dissociation enzyme. If I cannot inject the tissue, uh, tissue dissociation enzyme into the pancreas, I cannot digest the pancreas to release islet cells. If you compare the grass morphology of brain dead donor pancreas, the procedure is somewhat very straightforward. Before I go into the detail, the basic method of islet isolation is intraductal injection of enzyme collagenase to digest the pancreas in Riccardi chamber to release the islet cells, followed by purification using density gradients in COPE 299 cell processor. These are the purified islet cells you know, after, after purification process. Basically, the intact pancreas will become cell clusters after digesting with the enzyme collagenase and protease. So we use Riccardi chamber to digest the pancreas. As you see here, these are the, these are the isolated islet cells stained with the didizone, and these are exocrine acinar cells. As you know, more than 95% of cells in pancreas are exocrine cells, so I need to uh, purify these islet cells uh, after this digestion process. There, there are, there are uh, these, the entire islet isolation process is well standardized, utilizing thousands of brain dead donor research pancreases. These are the common steps 
we we used to digest chronic uh, brain dead donor pancreas uh, for our islet allo transplantation commonly we use like a one vial of collagenase and protease for intraductal injection and we use pressure controlled uh, pump to inject the enzyme into the pancreatic duct and uh, we use the duration of 12 to 15 minutes that's our standard enzyme injection duration there is no parenchymal injection or no enzyme recirculation in the case of brain dead donor pancreas most of the laboratories follow this islet isolation procedure but these procedures are not really effective in maximizing islet yield from uh, chronic pancreatitis pancreas so this is a fundamental problem so we need to follow you know different new method for our chronic pancreatitis cases then other problem is there is no clear cut off for islet isolation success in the case of uh, chronic pancreatitis pancreas for our islet auto transplantation for example in the case of clinical allo transplant uh, for our allo transplantation there is a clear definition of islet isolation success for example if we if we get less than 350000 islet equivalents which won't be sufficient to transplant 5000 islet cells per kilogram body weight that is the product release criteria so then i can clearly say you know if i if i don't achieve this number it's a failed isolation when i process pancreas for my research isolation if i get less than 200000 islets it is considered as a failed isolation but in the case of chronic pancreatitis you know whatever the number we isolate we infuse into the into into the patient so we don't know exactly you know what is our cut off you know how do we really know you know what we are achieving is the maximum number of islets you know from every from from those resected pancreas so in my view the islet isolation success for chronic pancreatitis pancreas for auto transplant should be the the undigested tissue mass so that is if we if we have less than 10% undigested tissue mass that should be the you know real cut off for 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 auto transplant so during human islet isolation for auto transplants or allo transplants we face entirely two different discrete problems for example in the case of islet allo transplantation many times we we notice low number of islets after digesting the pancreas for example if if the islet yield is less than 300000 we know this is not going to be sufficient for our transplant so but in many many times we see large number of islets after digesting the pancreas and because of a purification process we lose lot of islet cells in because if, if especially if the islets are embedded so this is a common problem in the case of islet allo transplantation in the case of auto transplantation digesting the pancreas itself is a real problem because of the fibrosis nature sometimes sometimes we 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 get good number of islet cells but we end up large tissue mass because mostly the purification process is not commonly done in chronic pancreatitis pain, uh, chronic pancreatitis pancreases so sometimes we end up really large tissue volume it's very difficult to infuse because we don't want to increase the portal pressure so these are the two common problems we commonly see in allo cases or auto cases this data from university of minnesota shows varying islet yield of less than 15000 islet equivalent to over a million islet cells from a 476 cases these isolations are somewhat done in the recent periods from 2007 to 2014 so whenever we achieve large number of islet cells are about 200000 it is not a major concern so whenever we get low number of islets then we really we, that especially we see low low number of islet cells especially from severely fibrotic pancreas then it's a real concern how to really maximize islet yield from these cases so there could be only two possible reasons either the number of islet cells in the given pancreas in the in the resected pancreas is really low or really the technical difficulty to recover the islet cells so when we analyzed histopathological analysis of various severely fibrotic pancreas shows you know varying amount of fibrosis plus a different islet architecture but in many cases many cases we see lot lot large number of islets you know we could see like a heterotopic uh, hypertrophic nature of the islet cells in even in severely fibrotic cases for example 
when we when we pro with the islet yield from minimal change chronic pancreatitis is somewhat is is comparable it was equivalent to brain dead donor pancreas which we use for our islet allo transplantation even the gross morphology of minimal change chronic pancreatitis is similar to uh, brain dead donor pancreas the degree of fibrosis and the degree of snr atrophy generally affect the islet yield uh, we get low number of islets in severely fibrotic pancreas when compared to minimal and moderate cases so, so we, we analyzed many uh, severely fibrotic pancreatic specimens and then we use islet area fraction measurement to see, you know, are we really seeing low number of islets. In many cases, as you see here, there are, lot, there are plenty of islets in this pancreas, although this pancreas is severely fibrotic, it's really difficult to digest the pancreas to release uh, these, these islets. So that's why the technical difficulty also plays a major role in chronic pancreatitis cases. So, in my, in, in, our op in my opinion, the key approaches to maximize islet yield is to minimize the undigestion of chronic pancreatitis, pancreas, and the effective enzyme delivery, and dosing the enzyme according to the severity of fibrosis, and the purification method uh, to reduce the tissue volume instead of trying to purify the islets. You know, we don't need purified islets in the case of chronic pancreatitis cases. So we want, to, we want to try to get reduced volume of tissue. So with this approach, it's easy to gain high number of islet cells. For the technical difficulties, because many pancreas comes with uh, either dilated duct or many times we don't even see the duct because the, there is a large, large number of calcification in, in those ducts. So in, in we, we have to make sure to really deliver the enzyme through the duct or through the parenchymal injection. Depending upon the fibrosis nature, we have to dose the enzyme collagenase and protease to digest those fibers. And uh, we have to select the collagenase and protease, which, which they have the capability to binding to this extracellular matrix for the digestion process. For example, so our main goal is to minimize the undigestion of these chronic pancreatitis <coughs> pancreas. For example, this, this is a classical example from a, from a brain dead donor pancreas. You could see minimal, minimal pancreas with large ductal cells. Again, this is another classical example from um, chronic pancreatitis pancreas. But this is a bad example from chronic pancreatitis pancreas in which we couldn't really digest large number of uh, tissue. So when we did histology, you know, we could see a lot of islet cells in this process. So our goal for when we process pancreas for chronic pancreatitis, it is mainly how to really minimize this uh, undigested tissue. For example, for ex th this is the standard approach. These are the modified approach we commonly follow for our autotransplants. So instead of using just one vial of collagenase and protease, which we commonly use for our brain dead donors, so we dose the enzyme. We want to make sure we have more than 26 inch unit per gram pancreas of collagenase, and we use hand syringe injection so that you can really feel the pressure, you know, when you try to inject the enzyme, whether you see a, whether there is a, you know, infusion of enzyme into the pancreatic duct or not. Then we, 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 we inject the enzyme instead of 12 to 15 minutes, we prolong the enzyme distension. By this method, you are not harming the pancreas. Basically, you are initiating the digestion during this distension process. And mainly we need a parenchymal injection and the enzyme recirculation approach. These to the, for these pancreas, we don't need, but we need to really bring this technique for our auto, auto transplantation process. The extracellular mat matrix composition is very different in chronic pancreatitis pancreas compared to normal pancreas. So we have to make sure our enzyme, enzyme is capable of digesting these fibers. For example, um, in brain dead donor pancreas, the collagen matrix type 1, 4, 5, and 6 are uniformly expressed. But in the case of chronic pancreatitis, these fibers are expressed in very high levels. Sometimes we see more than 1,000-fold increase in collagen and basement membrane proteins. The other example is the, especially the type 6 collagen and laminin levels are high in chronic pancreatitis pancreas when compared to brain dead donors. So we have to make sure our collagenase and protease are uh, digesting these fibers to release islet cells. 
these are the three commercially available collagenase enzymes uh, you know th these are the com commercially available ones so each company they supply collagenase and protease in different combination for example the company roche they supply collagenase in combination with thermolysin uh, the Sava enzyme company, they supply collagenase and the clastridium histolyticum neutral protease instead of thermolysin. And then the company Vitacite, they supply collagenase and BP protease. So among the labs, generally, it's very difficult to really uh, pick which protease. Collagenase is common in all three companies, but the, what is the best protease for chronic pancreatitis pa pancreas? Because these enzymes are commonly designed for isolating islet cells from brain dead donor pancreas for allotransplantation. So we did the extensive HPLC analysis, biochemical properties of these collagenase and proteases, and understanding the binding properties of these enzymes. <clears throat> um, you know, in 2012, we developed a new enzyme mixture combination Using this enzyme, we could digest more than 90% of the pancreas when compared to other enzyme combinations. And in recent times, we did, we did um, more than uh, eight, nine uh, design of experiments utilizing more than 100 human research pancreases to test different ratios, combinations, and doses, extreme doses of collagenase and protease to really decide which one is really suitable for mild pancreas, moderate pancreas, and the severely fibrotic pancreas. So ultimately, this is kind of our recommendation. This, this gives more details. Basically, we want to have more than 26 winch unit. If lab is using neutral protease or a dispase or thermolysin, this is kind of our recommendation. As enzyme distension is the critical step in the entire islet isolation process, we want to make sure we deliver the enzyme properly, either using pump, uh, in the case of minimal change chronic pancreatitis, pancreatitis like this, or using a hand syringe injection to deliver the enzyme throughout the pancreas. In some cases like this, when we see heterogeneous distribution of enzyme, for example, tail portion and diadenal portion received a large amount of enzyme, but here there may be a calcification in this region, so we may have to cut the pancreas, recannulate, and inject the enzyme to, to reach all parenchymal tissue. In some cases, if the, if the fibrosis is so severe, as you see here, the parenchymal tissue is replaced with white fibrous tissue. So we directly inject the enzyme throughout the pancreas. So otherwise, it's, it, you cannot really digest these type of pancreases. And we cut the pancreases into numerous pieces so that the, the, those pancreases get more enzyme exposure. These are the small, small techniques we follow to digest the pancreas. And even, even after selecting the best enzyme combination, best enzyme delivery method, sometimes during the digestion process, we don't see digestion at all in Ricardi chamber. So we wait, usually the, the, the digestion time is 15 to 20 minutes. If digestion prolongs more than 30 minutes, the, we do the research, enzyme recirculation approach. Basically with this approach, we open up the chamber, we, we open up the circuit, collect the enzymes along with the cells, quickly spin the, quickly spin the compound, and collect the tissue pellet, and the, add the enzyme back to the circuit. With this approach, it helps to digest, uh, digest the undigested portion of the pancreas. So this recirculation approach is really essential for chronic pancreatitis pancreas, especially if the digestion pro process prolongs more than 30 minutes. When we isolate islet cells from pediatric cases, uh, we do a lot of pediatric islet isolations. We see this type of uh, mantled islets. Islet cells are embedded inside the exocrine compartment. Although the exocrine compartment provides some kind of mechanical support to islet cells, but it's difficult to purify the islet cells. All these islet cells will sediment in the co back. It's, it's very difficult to really recover these islet cells. Moreover, so th this is a normal, this is, this is the normal islets, you know, free from exocrine cells, it's easy to separate. So when islets are like this, it's extremely difficult to separate. Uh, moreover, moreover the, uh, islet, uh, the islet tissue mass from pediatric cases is very high. Uh, from single gram pancreas, we get almost 0 0.5 cc pancreatic tissue when compared to older donor in which commonly we get 0 0.3 cc. 
So we developed young donor islet isolation protocol utilizing uh, many brain dead donor pancreas from five years old, two years old, 17 years old, even six months old human donor pancreas to, to isolate mantle free islets. So in the, the, the fundamental of this procedure is reduce the mechanical digestion during Riccardi chamber and enhance the collagenase digestion during the enzyme distension step, we go for a prolonged enzyme distension. Basically, we initiate the, we initiate the digestion uh, before it goes into the uh, Riccardi chamber. Sometimes we may have to use uh, two screens you know, in the Riccardi chamber to get mantle-free islets. Recently, we, we kind of really, you know, we um, modified the technique uh, and we, we consistently obtain mantle-free islet cells. Um, in this case, from a young donors, we extensively characterized extracellular matrix components, including various collagen and basement membrane. Based on this, we, we, we developed a trisector pancreas model to test different enzyme combinations to identify which combination gives better islet morphology in pediatric cases. Um, for example, in this case, when we have to have a low amount of collagenase and increased amount of protease in order to digest the basement membrane and cleave those exocrine cells, this approach really helps to consistently get mantle-free islets. This graph shows islet yield from uh, different age groups. Although the pancreas is generally small in pediatric cases, but we get higher number of islet cells per gram of pancreas from, from, from these cases using the um, young donor islet isolation protocol. Now I quickly switch the topic to purification step. Recovering these islet cells from this exocrine compartment is, is extremely difficult, especially if the islets are embedded like that. So we need to eliminate these exocrine cells and purify these islet cells. Um, generally, purification process leads to leads to loss of islet cells. That's why many laboratories, uh, those who are doing islet autotransplantation, they avoid purification step. May, many, many published studies reported that the average recovery using various different density gradient is only you know, 65 to 70 percent. So generally, almost 30 percent islet cell loss commonly occurs during the purification process. We developed this analytical test, analytical test gradient system to understand the exocrine cell density of these chronic pancreatitis cases. So using this simple test tube method, we could measure the exocrine ACNR cell density before we really run actual co-purification. The simple tube method clearly provides information about the exocrine cell density as well as islet cell density. For example, surprisingly, we observed that uh, that there is a significant difference, significant statistically significant difference in exocrine cell density in the case of allot allograft as well as autograft. So brain-dead donor pancreas, generally it comes from a brain-dead donor with long cold ischemia, and chronic pancreatitis pancreas, you know, it's from a living donor with short cold ischemia. So if we use us, generally, generally the gradient materials which we commonly use is designed for our allograft, so if we use this approach, naturally, we lose a lot of islet cells. For example, this is the protocol from, uh, from our uh, clinical islet transplantation consortium protocol. According to this protocol, we have to use 1.10 as a high density and 1.06 as a low density. If we use this, using, using, if we use this densities, we lose a lot of islet cells. Basically, because the exocrine cell density is heavier, we tend to really sediment a lot of islets in this process. So, so in order to avoid this, so we use a high density, high, density, high density purification process in which we use a high density for the bottom. With this procedure, it pushed the exocrine cells to the top layers. So there are, we collect one to 12 layers in order to collect the islet cells. So in this procedure, what happens, the islet purity is not really great, but at the same time, we could eliminate a lot of exocrine cells, which are sedimenting in the bottom. In this procedure, we also sediment a lot of islet cells with the exocrine cells. For example, this data shows we could reduce 
the tissue volume of 30 cc to 11 cc with the recovery of 87 percent using this heavy density approach. So this approach is definitely necessary because in the case of islet allow transplantation, our goal is to really purify the islets uh, from a 100 gram pancreas. Ultimately, we may get two grams, basically two cc of tissue in uh, islet auto transplantation cases from a 100 gram pancreas. Even if we get 15 cc, even up to 20 cc, it is easy to recover maximum number of islets and the infusion process won't be very difficult. So in summary, so this intraductal enzyme injection for brain dead donor pancreas, that step will be supplemented with parenchymal enzyme destruction because both procedures should be followed in the case of chronic pancreatitis. And uh, you know the enzyme, enzyme injection duration is strictly 12 to 15 minutes in the case of brain dead donor pancreas. But in, in chronic pancreatitis pancreas, we should really increase this uh, injection duration in order to initiate the digestion before it goes into the chamber, Ricardi chamber. And uh, the enzyme dose-wise, less than 20 wunsch unit per gram of collagenase would be sufficient for our uh, for brain-dead donor pancreas. But in this case, we need a minimum of greater than 26 wunsch unit per gram pancreas. And the enzyme recirculation approach is definitely necessary. So our focus should be mainly on enzyme selecting the right enzyme and the enzyme dose and the enzyme delivery approach plus this recirculation process and the purification with the aim of reducing the tissue volume and adding cryoprotective compound during islet isolation process because we use more than 10 different solutions the islets the pancreas is exposed to all kind of stress during the process we expose them to you know enzymes we you know we expose them to cold condition uh, 37 degree and uh, spinning those cells. So adding this cryoprotective compound, uh, it, we can really improve, not only improve the islet yield, we can also improve the islet quality. With this, I stop. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Apakalai. Um, we had made arrangements for a panel discussion, but two of our uh, speakers have to leave early, and I rather uh, continue and um, have a panel discussion with most of them being present. So why don't we take a break now?